Every corner of our globe has its share of ancient myths, deities of fertility, war, and love. Some are benevolent guardians, while others, ruthless and merciless, seem to revel in human suffering. This is a compilation of all the mythological gods I've covered so far. I hope you like the video. Number 1. Morrigan. The Morrigan, or Ghost Queen, was a fearsome Celtic deity and an Irish goddess of death and battle. She was both a single deity and a triple goddess, made up of the most powerful goddesses in Ireland. She was the keeper of destiny and the purveyor of prophecies. Appearing before great battles as the goddess of fate, the Morrigan offered prophecy and favor to heroes and gods alike. As the Ghost Queen, she circled the battlefield like a conspiracy of ravens to carry off the dead. Her husband was Dagda, the great god, who came to her for prophecies before great battles. The Morrigan was also the goddess of prophecy and destiny, and as such, she saw the future of all things, including the end of the world. She knew everything, and would occasionally share her knowledge with others, for a price. Her prophecies were never wrong, and her words were exact. Number 2. Cthulhuin. Cthulhuin was the great hero of the Ulster Cycle, champion of the Irish realm. He was the son of the gods, lover of the fairy queen, and enemy of many worthy opponents. Descendant of the gods, he defended Ireland and Scotland from his many threats with unstoppable fury and an iron will. His passions were great, his sorrows deep, and his actions undeniably heroic. To this day, he remains Ireland's best-known folk hero. Cuchulain was first and foremost a warrior. From an early age, he trained in Ireland and Scotland to become a powerful killing machine. His skill was unmatched, and he was more than capable of taking on many enemies at once. In battle, Cthulhu's greatest asset was his battle rage. He used to go berserk in the heat of battle, becoming an unstoppable force that would kill friend and foe alike. Those around him had to do everything they could to calm him down. In battle, he wielded Gay Bulg, a spear of deadly pain fashioned from the bones of a sea monster. Cthulhu was bound by two separate Gaius, magical taboos that granted him great strength, as long as he didn't break his rules. The first of these rules, was that he should take and eat whatever food a woman offered him. The second was that he couldn't eat dog meat at all. These Gaius would ultimately lead to his demise as he was forced to make an impossible choice between the two. Number three, Lug. Lug was the Irish god of kings, justice, and government. Master of all arts, he was also a cunning trickster and the wielder of a sol, the lightning spear. His titles were numerous, but the most famous of his was Lamfada, of the long arm, a reference to the length of his spear in battle. As the god of oaths, he dominated rulers and the nobility. He also served as the god of justice in his many guises. His judgment was often quick and merciless. In what may seem like a contradiction, Lug was also a trickster who was willing to lie, cheat, and steal in order to defeat his opponents. Lug used various weapons and tools throughout his adventures. The spear, Sleg, this spear was unbeatable in battle and could take the form of lightning when thrown. Fragarach, or the Answerer, sword of his adoptive father Mananan. The sword would force those he aimed at to answer questions honestly. Various horses, including the horse Enbar, which could travel by land and sea. And the last of his companions was Philinus, a renowned greyhound who always caught his prey, was invincible in battle and could turn water into wine. Number 4. Brigid. Brigid, the Exalted, was the Irish goddess of fertility, poetry, and dawn, among other titles. Brigid often appeared as a fiery-haired goddess wearing a sunbeam cloak. Sometimes known as the Goddess of Wells, Brigid was one of the most prominent deities in Ireland. Beloved by poets, she was a master of both healing and smithing. Her festival, Imbolc, fell on February 1st and marked the midpoint of winter. She shares many similarities with the Catholic Saint Brigid of Kildare, the patron saint of Ireland. Evidence of worship of her has been found throughout Ireland, reflecting her importance as a powerful deity. And I take this opportunity to mention that if you like mythology and the gods, go through the channel to see the video of the Norse gods. Subscribe if you want more content like this on the channel. Number 5. Cernunos Cernunos was the Gaelic god of beasts and wild places, Often called the Cuckold, 
Cernunos was a mediator of man and nature, able to tame predator and prey so they could lie down together. Although Cernunos himself appeared primarily in ancient Gaul, similar characters have been found throughout the world, including in other Celtic regions. Often he appeared as a bearded man with horns. Cernunos was a nature god who ruled over primeval nature and uncivilized forms. Animals were his subjects and free-growing fruits and vegetables his reward. Classic depictions of the deity included assemblies of animals such as moose, wolves, snakes, and aurochs. Such gatherings were made possible by Cernunos's ability to bring natural enemies into peaceful communion with one another. Number 6. Danu The Irish mother goddess Danu was the ancestor from whom all Tuatha de Danann claimed descent. Despite her importance to Irish mythology, Danu remains largely a mystery. Many scholars believed that the Danu was a representation of the Danube River. As the goddess of sovereignty and power, Danu would grant gifts to rulers and the highborn. Though such gifts varied in value and substance, it is nonetheless clear that the kings, chiefs, and gods of the Tuatha de Danann drew their power from her. As a mother goddess, Danu was believed to have nursed many of the gods and instilled in them a sense of wisdom. Number 7. Aran. Aran is the Welsh lord of the kingdom of Anion, also known as the Underworld. A just and just ruler, he is a powerful mage who leads the hosts of Anion and is a master hunter. When Christians began to demonize Welsh mythology, Aran took on many negative traits and gained titles beyond the traditional lord of the Underworld or Otherworld. He became the lord of the damned, who oversees souls denied Christian paradise and whose hounds of hell eternally seek out the souls of the impure. Number 8. Angus Angus the Younger was an Irish deity of love, poetry, and youth. His music and his poetry enchanted women and inspired kings. Angus served as one of the chief bards of the Tuatha de Danann. His cunning and poetic use of language often allowed her to outdo her elders. Angus's youth granted him certain powers over life and death, including the ability to raise the dead. His breath would grant life to those he wished to resurrect, though the effects were not always permanent. His magic allowed him to transform kisses into birds, animals that he preferred above all others. Angus's appearance was that of a handsome young man. He was often accompanied by birds that circled his head and acted as messengers and tormentors in equal measure. Number 9. Caridwen. Caridwen is a Welsh white witch, a sorceress of great power. She can brew life-altering potions to change her shape and inspire knowledge and beauty in others. Caridwen is one of the most powerful witches in Celtic mythology. Both a mother and a wise woman, she is blessed with the gift of poetic wisdom, inspiration, and prophecy, collectively called Awen in Welsh tradition. This power comes from her magical cauldron, where she brews excellent potions to help others. Potions brewed from her cauldron range, such as changing the appearance of others, allowing the drinker to shapeshift, or giving Awen's gift. Although her potions grant the gift, they are also quite dangerous. Once she gives herself the gift, a single drop of the potion has the power to kill. She is very careful who gives her her potions, as she does not wish to harm others, but she knows that power comes at a price. Caridwin is a white witch, which means that she uses her gifts and her cauldron to help others. Number 10. Gwydion. Gwydion was the great magician and trickster. His character, like his magic, varied from benevolent to evil. The name Gwydion could have meant born of the trees. A cunning and skilled wizard, Gwydion was able to use magic to enhance his own abilities and change the shapes of others. While his main attribute was his skillful mind, he was also a capable warrior strong enough to defeat one of the most powerful lords in Wales in single combat. According to medieval Welsh poetry, his magic could create women from flowers. Number 11. Kailiak. Known as the Queen of Winter, the Kailiak controlled the weather and the winds. Popular with poets, the Divine Witch remains prominent in Ireland, Scotland, and the Isle of Man. Kailiak determined the length and harshness of winter. Her name is a common Scottish and Irish Gaelic word meaning old woman or witch, mostly as a veiled old woman, sometimes with only one eye. Her skin was deathly pale or blue, while her teeth were red and her clothing was adorned with skulls. She could leap mountains and ride storms. She was a creator deity who shaped much of the known landscape. It is not clear if she did it on purpose. Her tools of creation and destruction included her hammer, 
with which she was able to control storms and thunder. In some legends, she also controlled a well that occasionally overflowed and flooded the land. Number 12. Dagda. Dagda was the chief of the Irish Tuatha de Danann. His children were plentiful, as were his lovers. He was not only the god of life and death, but also of fertility and agriculture. He too was a druid, and as such was proficient in all things magical and mystical. His beard was long and unruly, and he wore a woolen cape around his head. Dagda often carried with him three holy relics. The Quar Ansik, a cauldron that could produce a bountiful feast. The Lorg Mor, a powerful staff that possessed two different powers. His head had the power to kill nine men with a single blow, while his handle could revive the dead with just a touch. The Waithni, an ornate harp carved from oak. This harp could place the seasons in their proper order and master the will and emotions of men. In addition to these items, the Dagda owned two pigs, one always growing, the other always roasting. Number 1. Zeus In Greek mythology, no god was more powerful or more revered than Zeus, king of the gods, god of thunder and lightning. According to legend, Zeus was born to the titans Cronus and Rhea. Cronus, fearing that one of his children would overthrow him, swallowed each of his newborns. But Rhea managed to save Zeus by hiding him and tricking Cronus into swallowing them up instead. When Zeus grew up, he led a rebellion against his father and the other titans. With the help of his brothers and the Cyclopes, he defeated them and became ruler of the gods on Mount Olympus. Zeus was known for his wisdom and his sense of justice. He was a just ruler who defended the natural order and punished those who broke the rules. He was often depicted as a wise and regal figure, with a long beard and a thunderbolt in his hand. But Zeus was also known for his many romantic adventures, both with mortal women and other goddesses. These adventures often generated jealousy and conflict among the gods, and many of Zeus's sons and descendants became famous heroes of Greek mythology. Zeus was revered as a powerful and influential god who controlled the forces of nature and ruled the affairs of mortals and immortals alike. His lightning bolt was a symbol of his power, and he was often worshipped with sacrifices and offerings. I am more simple. I am satisfied that if you are liking this video, you hit the like button and comment below. This is the only way to beat the god of this platform called the algorithm. Number 2. Poseidon In Greek mythology, the sea was ruled by Poseidon, god of the sea and earthquakes. Poseidon was one of the twelve Olympian gods and was known for his power and strength. He was often depicted as a muscular, bearded figure, wielding a trident, which he used to raise storms and control waves. According to legend, Poseidon was also born to the titans Cronus and Rhea and was one of six brothers. Like his brother Zeus, Poseidon fought against his father and the titans, helping to overthrow them and establish the rule of the Olympian gods. Poseidon was worshipped as the god of the sea, and many sailors and seafarers prayed to him for safe passage and protection. He too was associated with horses, and was often depicted riding a chariot drawn by magnificent steeds. One of the most famous myths of Poseidon has to do with his trident, which he received from the Cyclops. With this powerful weapon, Poseidon could cause earthquakes, create storms and tidal waves, and even split rocks and create springs. Poseidon was worshipped in many temples throughout the ancient world, but one of the most famous was the Temple of Poseidon at Sunion. This temple was dedicated to Poseidon as the god of the sea and was a popular destination for travelers and worshippers alike. Poseidon may have been a fearsome and powerful god, but he was also a symbol of the vast and unpredictable power of the sea. His influence is still felt today, and the stories and legends of him continue to amaze us. Number 3. Hades In Greek mythology, the underworld was ruled by Hades, god of the dead and the afterlife. Hades was one of the twelve Olympian gods, but unlike his brother Zeus and Poseidon, he ruled the underworld, the realm of the dead. He was often depicted to her as a stern and distant figure, with a dark beard and piercing eyes, seated on his throne of bones. One of the most famous myths of Hades involves his kidnapping of Persephone, daughter of the goddess Demeter. Hades fell in love with Persephone and tricked her into eating pomegranate seeds, which meant that she had to spend part of the year in the underworld as her queen. 
This myth explained the changing of the seasons, as Demeter mourned the absence of her daughter and refused to let the plants grow. Hades was also associated with the River Styx, the river that separated the world of the living from the underworld. The souls of the dead had to cross the river with the help of the ferryman Charon, and Hades would judge them and assign them to the most appropriate destination in the afterlife. Another famous aspect of Hades' mythology is his watchdog, Cerberus. This three-headed beast guarded the entrance to the underworld and prevented living beings from entering or dead souls from escaping. In the underworld, Hades presided over the fields of asphodels, a place where ordinary souls would go after death. However, there were other destinations as well, such as the Elysian Fields for heroes and Tartarus for villains. Hades may have been a dark and sinister figure, but he was also a major god in Greek mythology, presiding over the afterlife and ensuring that the dead were judged and assigned to their proper places. Number 4. Hera Hera was one of the most powerful and influential goddesses in Greek mythology. As the wife of Zeus, king of the gods, she was revered as the queen of the gods and goddesses, and she was known for her beauty, intelligence, and fierce determination to protect her family and her dominance. Hera was the goddess of marriage, childbirth, and the family, and couples often invoked her for her blessings on their union. She was said to preside at weddings and bless the marriage bed, and she was revered as a protector of families and children. But Hera was also a goddess who commanded respect and loyalty. She was known for her powerful and unyielding nature, and was often depicted holding a scepter, a symbol of her authority and power over gods and mortals alike. Throughout her mythology, Hera was a force to be reckoned with. She was known for her intense rivalries with other gods and goddesses, particularly with the many lovers and illegitimate children of her husband Zeus. Hera was often portrayed as a jealous and vengeful figure, punishing those who crossed her path or threatened her family. But Hera was also a goddess of great beauty and royalty, and was often depicted on her throne, surrounded by peacocks, symbols of her majesty and power. Despite her fierce reputation, Hera was also a complex and multifaceted figure, embodying both the positive and negative aspects of the human experience. She was a goddess who inspired both awe and fear. Number 5. Demeter Demeter is one of the most important goddesses in Greek mythology, and she is known for her abilities as a goddess of agriculture and fertility. It is said that Demeter was the one who taught humans to cultivate the land, to sow and to reap. She is also considered the protector of the fields, and her blessing was believed to be necessary for a good harvest. Another of Demeter's abilities is her ability to control the weather and the seasons of the year. She believes that she is able to grow plants and crops just by moving her hand. Furthermore, it is said that she can cause earthquakes and other earth-related natural disasters. As a loving mother, Demeter is known for her great strength and determination. When her daughter Persephone was kidnapped by Hades, the god of the underworld, Demeter devoted herself to searching for her tirelessly, and her grief caused her to neglect the land, which caused a great famine, and gave rise to the seasons of the year. Number 6. Athena Athena is the goddess of wisdom, military strategy, arts and crafts, justice and civilization. Athena is known for her intellectual and strategic abilities. She is the patron saint of the city of Athens, and it is believed that it was she who taught humans to grow olive trees and to weave, making her the goddess of crafts. In addition, she Athena is a warrior goddess and protector of heroes. She is known for her ability to plan strategies and carry out successful tactical actions in war. She is also the protector of warriors and brave men, and it is believed that she can grant them special abilities in battle. Athena is a fair and civilized goddess. She is credited with creating laws and promoting justice and equality. She is also a protective goddess of citizens, especially women and children. Number 7. Apollo. He is the god of the sun, music, poetry, healing, knowledge, and prophecy. Apollo is known for his beauty and his grace. It is said that he is a talented musician and poet, and that he is the creator of the lyre, a stringed instrument that became one of the most important in Greek culture. He is also considered a healing god, and is believed to have the ability to heal illnesses and injuries. Also, 
Apollo is known for his prophetic ability. In Greek myth, Apollo is said to be able to predict the future and send messages to humans through oracles and prophecies. He is also the protector of the city of Delphi, where the famous Oracle of Delphi is located. Apollo is a warrior god and protector of heroes. He believes that he can grant special abilities in battle and that he helps the heroes in their adventures. He is also the god of the sun, and it is believed that he drives his chariot across the sky each day, bringing light and warmth to Earth. Number 8. Artemis Artemis is one of the most important goddesses in Greek mythology. She is the goddess of the hunt, the moon, wild nature, and protector of young women. Artemis is known for her skill in hunting and protecting nature. It is said that she is an expert hunter and that she always manages to catch her prey. She is also the protector of wild animals, and it is believed that she can punish those who harm them without reason. In addition, Artemis is the goddess of the moon and is related to her power and beauty. She is believed that she has the ability to change the shape of the moon from dark to light, and that she is able to control the elements of the night and the mysteries of the full moon. Artemis is also a protective goddess of young women. She is considered a protector of maidens, and it is said that she can help protect women in situations of danger or difficulty. Number 9. Ares. Ares is the god of war in Greek mythology and is known for his ferocity and bravery on the battlefield. Ares is believed to be the god of war and conflict. He is described as a fearless warrior, never stopping at anything and having incredible strength in battle. Ares is often depicted with armor and weapons of war, such as swords and spears, and it is said that he can protect and aid warriors in battle. Although often described as a violent god, Ares is also known for his capacity for justice and the protection of family and loved ones. In Greek mythology, Ares was considered the father of the Amazons and was seen as a protector of warrior women. In addition, it is said that Ares had the ability to transform into different forms, which allowed him to infiltrate the battle and surprise his enemies. He is also related to the fertility and prosperity of the land. Number 10. Aphrodite. Aphrodite is the goddess of love and beauty in Greek mythology and is known for her beauty and seduction. Aphrodite is said to be the goddess of beauty and attraction and has the ability to make people fall head over heels for her. She is considered the protector of love and passion, and it is believed that she can influence the hearts of men and women to fall in love. Also, Aphrodite is known for her ability to seduce. She is often depicted with great beauty and an aura of mystery that makes her even more attractive. She is able to use her beauty and charm to get what she wants, and she is said to have seduced many of the gods and mortals of Greek mythology. Aphrodite is also considered the protector of fertility and reproduction. She is associated with the creation of life, and it is believed that she can help women who have difficulty conceiving or having children. Number 11. Hephaestus. Hephaestus is the Greek god of fire, metallurgy, and crafts. Hephaestus is often described as a lame god, and this disability is believed to be due to his being thrown from Olympus by his mother Hera when he was born. However, despite his limp, Hephaestus is a talented and powerful god. It is said that Hephaestus is the god of the forge and metallurgy, and that he has the ability to create powerful weapons and tools for the gods and mortals. He is also known for his ability to create magical items, such as Aphrodite's magical belt, which made her irresistible to men. Furthermore, it is said that Hephaestus has the ability to control fire and metal, and that he is able to make metal melt and mold to his will. He is also credited with mechanical and technological skills, as he is said to have created many ingenious machines and gadgets. Number 12. Hermes. Hermes is the Greek god of trade, travelers, thieves, messengers, and shepherds. He is known for his ability to travel between the world of the gods and the world of mortals, as well as his cunning and quickness. It is said that Hermes is the messenger of the gods and that he has the ability to quickly travel between Olympus and Earth to carry messages and news. He is also credited with guiding and protecting abilities for travelers, especially those traveling by land. Also, Hermes is known for his cunning and ability to deceive. He is credited with theft and deception skills and is said to have deceived many of the gods and mortals of Greek mythology. He is also depicted wearing a winged hat and winged sandals, which allow him to quickly fly from one place to another. Another ability of Hermes is to protect shepherds and their flocks, and he is considered the patron of shepherds and herdsmen. 
He is also credited with healing abilities and is considered a protector of the sick. Number 13. Dionysus. Dionysus is the Greek god of wine, festivals, and fertility. He is known for his ability to create wine and spread ecstasy and joy among mortals. Dionysus is the god of wine and is credited with the ability to create wine from grapes. Furthermore, he is often depicted in the company of satyrs and nymphs, and it is said that he taught mortals the art of viticulture. He is also credited with the ability to transform water into wine. In addition, Dionysus is the god of the festival and is often depicted in the company of bacchantes and drunken men. It is said that his presence can spread ecstasy among mortals, causing them to break free of their inhibitions and indulge in joy and fun. He is also credited with fertility abilities and is considered a protector god of nature and animals. He is often depicted as a handsome young god, dressed in animal skins and crowned with a wreath of ivy. Number 14. Hestia. Hestia is the Greek goddess of the home, family, and architecture, and is known for her role as protector of home and community. Hestia is the goddess of the hearth and is credited with the ability to protect homes and communities from mortals. She is often depicted sitting on a chair with a veil, symbolizing her role as protector of the home. She is also credited with the ability to hold the sacred flame, which symbolizes the continuity and stability of the home and community. Additionally, Hestia is the goddess of architecture and is credited with the ability to guide architects and builders in the construction of homes and buildings. She is also considered a symbol of stability and continuity in society and is credited with preservation and conservation skills. In Greek mythology, Hestia is known for her calmness and her love of harmony and peace. She is often depicted as a kind and protective goddess who has a calming and comforting presence. One, Ebisu. Perpetually smiling and often dressed as a fisherman, Ebisu is one of the seven lucky gods and is, in fact, the only one originally from Japan. The image of him has seen widespread use throughout Japan due to its close association with wealth from the sea and business prosperity. Often depicted as a stocky fisherman in a large hat, Ebisu is associated with the bounty of the sea and the luck it takes to bring said bounty home. He is always smiling and laughing, and carries around a fishing rod and a large fish, usually a red sea rafter or red bass most of the time. As the patron saint of sailors and those who live off the bounty of the sea, Ebisu is represented in animal form by whales, jellyfish, and whale sharks. 2. Amno Uzume Amno Uzume is the Shinto goddess of dawn, a master of joy, humor, and dance. A highly positive kami, her ingenuity brought Amaterasu, the goddess of the sun, back to the world, saving the land from the eternal night of winter. Amano Uzume is credited with creating many forms of Japanese art, such as Kagura, a kind of dance that tells the stories of kami, and some forms of comedy and theater, such as ancient no. Amano Uzume is often performed in Kyogen, a tradition of comic theater, and here she is often shown half-naked for comic effect. Due to these theatrical connections, Amno Uzume is the goddess of revelry. 3. Suzanu A powerful and boisterous guardian kami, Suzanu's moods are often as temperamental as his actions are chaotic. His fight with the dragon Orochi led to the creation of the Kusanagi no Tsurugi sword, a part of Japan's sacred regalia. Suzanu is a tumultuous deity at heart, and his chaotic mood and disheveled appearance are direct reflections of his status as a storm god. The seas surrounding southern Japan, where many of his shrines are located, reflect these attributes. Like many storm, wind, and sea kami who serve under him, Suzanu can be both benevolent and malevolent. He remains one of the most famous heroes in Japanese mythology. In what is now his most famous feat, he fought and slayed the fearsome eight-headed dragon, Yamata no Orochi. Suzanu's own shrines are plentiful and popular. They include Kumano Taisha, his most important shrine, in Matsue, Shimani Prefecture, as well as the Yasaka Shrine, in Higashiyama, and the Hikawa Shrine, in Saitama Prefecture. 4. Fujin Fujin is the Japanese wind god, a powerful elemental deity whose pocket of air moves all the world's winds. Appearing alongside his brother Reijin, the god of thunder, Fujin is neither good nor evil, though he is often a destructive force. He is one of the best-known oni, 
demons, devils, or trolls in Japanese folklore. With green skin and wind-blown red-white hair, his monstrous face is like a hungry ogre with wide, fearful eyes. He wears a leopard skin, and around his shoulders is a large pocket of air, which he uses to propel himself around the world, which in turn creates the world's winds and storms. Fujin rides on a cloud, alternately represented as a gray thundercloud or a fluffy cumulus. Each of his hands has four fingers, one per cardinal direction. Although Fujin is seen primarily as a destructive force, he can also be associated with less intense winds that are gentle and refreshing. Therefore, compared to his brother Reijin, Fujin is somewhat less intense and more careless. 5. Reijin Reijin is the Japanese god of storms, a chaotic being born of death who brings the world rains of life, as well as chaos and destruction. He flies through the sky in dark clouds and casts lightning bolts on the unsuspecting inhabitants below. A popular kami despite his connection to death and destruction, Reijin is depicted in Shinto and Buddhist imagery, as well as popular belief and folk art. Reijin is the master of thunder and lightning, controlling the power of storms. His connection to Yomi, the land of the dead, is part of his being, which is made clear through his hideous appearance. With a terrifying, toothy grin, stern eyebrows, and lean, muscular appearance, his expression is almost always angry or gleefully destructive, like a hungry demon. Despite this, he is often depicted wearing a traditional Buddhist halo, a common motif around holy or divine figures. He also appears with a drum, with which he creates thunder. He is always in the company of Fujin, the god of the winds, and occasionally the thunder beast, Raiyu. Raijin is the one who brings rain, a blessing to farmers. It is said that Raijin's lightning bolt, when he strikes a crop, produces a bountiful yield. 6. Amaterasu Amaterasu is the queen of heaven, the kami, and creation itself. Although she did not create the universe, she is the goddess of creation, a role she inherited from her father, Izanagi, who now defends the world from the land of the dead. Amaterasu's main role is that of the goddess of the sun. In this position, she not only serves as the literal rising sun illuminating all things, but also provides nourishment for all living creatures and marks the orderly movement of day into night. The sun represents order and purity, two of the most important concepts in Shinto. All things in creation are ordered, from Amaterasu to the inhabitants of Jigoku. The imperial family owns three sacred relics that come directly from Amaterasu herself. Together, these relics are known as Japan's imperial regalia. Yata no Kagami, the mirror of eight sticks, was used to lure Amaterasu out of the cave in which she was hiding. Yasakani no Magatama, the great jewel, is a magatama, a curved necklace of beads or jewels common during the Japanese prehistoric period. The great jewel is believed to have been lost during the Genpei War. Kusanagi no Tsurugi, the grass cutter sword, also known as the heavenly sword of gathering clouds, was owned by Amaterasu's brother Suzanu and represented virtue. 7. Tsukuyomi Tsukuyomi no Mikoto is the Japanese god of the moon, a proud deity of order and beauty. Tsukuyomi, the estranged husband of the sun goddess Amaterasu, spends eternity chasing her across the sky. Tsukuyomi is very compatible with his wife Amaterasu. Handsome and composed, he believes in order and etiquette, and enforces it whenever he can. His application of such ideals extends to the point that he is willing to kill to maintain order. Although the moon is often considered beautiful and worth seeing, Tsukuyomi himself is seen as a negative figure in Shinto and Japanese folklore. However, this does not prevent him from having shrines, such as one at Matsunu Taisha in Kyoto. 8. Izanagi Izanagi is one of the divine creators who, along with his wife Izanami, created the islands of Japan. He is the father of countless kami and the bureaucracy of the heavens, presided over by his daughter, the sun goddess Amaterasu. Izanagi is considered the father of the Japanese pantheon and is sometimes portrayed as a creator deity. Although the latter is not entirely accurate, it is true that he is the father of many kami. Izanagi also fends off Yomi's forces and ensures that every day there are more births than deaths to preserve his creation. Izanagi's story is central to the Kuniyumi, the origins of Japan told in many traditions. From the void came heaven and earth. At first, however, only the sky was populated. Seeing that the earth was intact, the primordial deities gave Izanagi and Izanami their blessings to fill it with life. 9. Inari 
Inari is the Japanese kami of prosperity, tea, agriculture, especially rice, industry, and blacksmithing. A complex deity with many faces, Inari is referred to as masculine, feminine, and androgynous, depending on the context. Although Inari's role has changed over time, they have been popular throughout Japan for over a thousand years. Inari is perhaps best known due to her association with foxes, called Kitsuni, who act as Inari's messengers and receive protection in return. Inari is an incredibly popular deity who has more shrines dedicated to them than any other kami in Japan. A third of all the shrines in the country are Inari shrines. This is largely because Inari's many attributes have given the deity great significance to Japanese society and have helped Inari stand the test of time. Over the centuries, as Japanese society has changed and its priorities developed, Inari has changed along with the culture to take on new roles. 10. Ninigi In Japanese mythology, Ninigi is the grandson of Amaterasu. Sent to Japan to cultivate the first crop of rice, he brought civilization to both kami and humans, and is the great-grandfather of Emperor Jimu. Japan's first emperor. Ninigi is therefore the honored ancestor and progenitor of the current imperial family of Japan. By planting the first rice seed, he brought civilization, justice, and agriculture to the country. This story could be seen as representing the immigration of the Yayoi people from the Asian continent to Japan. Unlike the hunter-gatherers who populated Japan during that period, the Yayoi were farmers, and their arrival coincided with the boom in cultivated rice. Ninigi also links the Japanese imperial family to the gods, acting as a kind of bridge between the ruling class and the divine. Ninigi became mortal and died. A burial mound associated with Ninigi is located at Inogorio in Hyuga. 1. Itzamna this god was counted among one of the most popular Mayan deities in the pre-Columbian pantheon. He was designated as the king of heaven, night and day. In the mythic narrative, his dominance over these vast domains is powered by innate and even arcane knowledge, as opposed to supernatural strength and unquestioned kingship. To that end, he was often portrayed as a toothless old man with a gentle demeanor, a hooked nose, large eyes, and a cylindrical hat alluding to his leadership qualities. In some cases, he is portrayed as the son of the powerful but capricious creator god Hunab Ku, who caused floods to wipe out the human race. Rather, Itzamna is portrayed as an antithesis to his father, as he helps the ancient Maya invent writing, sacred calendar systems, agriculture, science, and Mayan medicine. This suggests that, mythically, Itzamna also played his role in the creation of human beings. In short, he was perceived as a cultural hero who laid the foundation for a civilization that would later flourish. Itzamna is also identified as the husband of Ixchel, and together they were revered as the couple who gave birth to a whole generation of powerful gods. Interestingly, in terms of etymology, Itzamna means lizard or big fish in the Mayan language, with the prefix ITZ also alluding to divinity, prediction, and even witchcraft in other associated Mesoamerican languages. To that end, Itzamna is also called by other names, including Kukulkan, and being depicted as a feathered serpent or even as a hybrid creature with human and lizard features. Number 2. Ixchel Ixchel was an important female deity in the Maya pantheon. Often called the Rainbow Lady, the goddess is associated with the moon, weather, fertility, children, and health. In the mythical narrative, she was known for the dual aspect of herself. As goddess, she was represented as a young and beautiful seductress who advocated fertility, marriage, and love. In this aspect, she became associated with both lunar cycles and rabbits, and was often given epithets such as ixik -e, moon lady. Historically, the deity's eminence as one of the important goddesses can be discerned from the depictions of her in works of art and centers of worship. To that end, the Maya may have made a pilgrimage across the Caribbean in ceremonial canoes to one of their temples on the island of Cozumel, now the ruins of San Gervasio. She, on the other hand, was represented as a withered old woman who had the power to create and destroy the earth. Counted among the mighty gods of the Mayan pantheon, the goddess was also depicted with claws, fangs, and a red body adorned with symbols of death and skulls, and this incarnation was called Chak-Chel, Red Rainbow. 
Number 3. Kinich Ahau Kinich Ahau was the name of the sun god of the Yucatecan Maya, that is, the Mayan people of Yucatan. Interestingly, in some cases, given her association with an element of the sky, the Mayan god is also considered to be an aspect of Itzamna, the aforementioned ruler of the heavens. In a mythical narrative, Ixchel, the goddess of the moon, impresses him by wearing a fine woven gown, and the two eventually become lovers, although their relationship later turns tumultuous. As for the representations, Kinich Ahau, in keeping with her royal status, was often depicted with a hooked nose, large square eyes, and even a beard. And like other comparable Maya deities, the great god was also represented in a dual way in some codices, as an old man with crooked teeth. Incredibly, he was also associated with the jaguar in Mayan culture, as the sun god was believed to transform into the feline predator at night. In addition, he was further revered as the patron god of the unit of day. Number 4. Chak Chak was the Mayan deity of rain, which made him a very important figure in the agricultural civilization of the Maya. In addition, he was also revered as the god of thunder and storms, with a particular motif based on a myth suggesting how he struck clouds with jade axes to cause rain. Such powerful actions nurtured the various crops, especially maize, which is often attributed as a gift from Kchak to the Maya people after he discovered the plant inside a rock, and he furthered the natural cycle of life in terms of regeneration. Now, in terms of history, it should be noted that Chak probably played his symbolic role in the human sacrifices performed by the Mayan priests on top of the pyramid temples. To that end, some of the attendants holding the victims might even have dressed as Chak to represent the four cardinal directions. Regarding the myths of the Mayan culture, he is presented as the brother of the sun god, Kinich Ahau. And while these brothers were close, Chak fell in love with the beautiful wife of Kinich Ahau and consequently suffered the punishment for her immoral relationship. To that end, few Mayan legends tell how the rain is produced when Chak cries out for repentance, thus contradicting the axe effect in the clouds. Many Maya kings were revered as rainmakers, which underlines his strong relationship with Chak. Interestingly, despite being the gods of rain, Chak was believed to dwell not in the skies, but in the depths of caves and cenotes. Number 5. Yum Kimmel Things get a bit complicated when it comes to the mythical reach of the Mayan gods of death. The reason is that there are quite a few deities that were associated with the aspect of death. Yum Kimmel, also known as the fleshless god adopting the state of decomposition, was depicted with his skeletal mask, protruding belly, full of decaying matter, body adorned with bones, and no neck adorned with eyeless sockets. In some narratives, he rules over the nine subterranean worlds known as Mitnal. Within this hellish realm, Yum Kimmel takes sadistic pleasure in extinguishing the very essence of souls by torturing them with fire and water. Interestingly, his counterpart, or other aspect, Apuk, despite the deadly air of him, has some comedic or scatological elements, some involving flatulence and anus. Number 6. Yum Kaax. Known as the Lord of the Forests, he was possibly among the youngest of the Maya gods and goddesses. The deity, as his name suggests, was probably revered as the guardian of the forest and protector of wildlife, both flora and fauna. Often depicted with an elaborate corn headdress and pots of corn cobs in hand, he was possibly worshipped by farmers and hunters alike. The above connection alludes to how the Mayan god was also revered as a deity of agriculture, so much so that many offered their first fruits to the deity of the forest. As for the latter, hunters had to offer special prayers and rituals asking for Yumkax's permission and guidance, especially when hunting deer. Number 7. Hunhunapu He was revered as a tragic figure in Mayan religion, which was more important culturally because of his two sons, the hero twins Hunapu and Ixbalank. In the most prominent tale, Hun Hunapu and his own brother were tricked by the Mayan death gods into a ball game only to be sacrificed later. His head was hung as a trophy on a gourd tree. However, the head of Hun Hunapu, which still had the divine sentience of it, spat at a passing young woman, thus impregnating her with her saliva. Later, she gave birth to the hero twins Hunapu and Ekspalanke, who avenged her father by defeating the gods of the underworld. Unfortunately, the twins were unable to resurrect his father after retrieving his head. 
Symbolically, however, the Maya believed that Hunhunapu was reborn as corn. Number 8. Huracan. Residing in the infinite sky, Huracan or Heart of Heaven, as one of the main Mayan gods, was believed to be the primordial force unleashed by the dual divinities. The creator gods needed this chaotic force to chisel the order of creation and its manifestation on the physical plane. In a nutshell, Huracan was considered to be the antithetical being whose essence and behavior ironically lead to the survival of life. An example would belong to a mythical narrative that supposes how it was Hurricane who sent a great flood to end an entire generation of humans and invoke the earth for the renewal of life. Given his immense power and his chaotic origins, Hurricane was often associated with lightning, wind, and storms, with the former often perceived as a manifestation of both fire and fertility. Interestingly, in some tales, Huracan is the one who opened the mountains with his lightning to reveal the hidden corn seed, which led to the agricultural prowess of the Mayan people. As for the representations, the Mayan god of the storm was represented with a branched nose and a leg that transformed into a snake at the end. Number 9. Ixtab. Incredibly, the Dresden Codex contains a relatively graphic image of a dead or passed out woman with a rope around her neck, dangling from the celestial sky band. And this mythical motif is often perceived as representing Ixtab, the Mayan goddess of suicide. However, on closer inspection of the Dresden Codex, the image of the hanged woman is depicted in the section dealing with eclipses, and as such, this particular depiction may have signified the occurrence of a lunar eclipse. As for another hypothesis, Ixtab could have been the female version of Atab, a minor Mayan god of the hunt associated with trapping or tricking. Consequently, the female counterpart of her was possibly regarded as the benevolent executioner, who was also associated with cheating. Number 10. Akan. Often associated with alcoholic beverages, Akan was considered one of the Mayan gods who delighted in boisterous celebrations and drinks. Unsurprisingly, he was the patron of the Balche, a Mesoamerican cocktail made from fermented honey and the bitter bark of the Blash tree. Essentially, Akan was possibly perceived as the divine partier, thus mirroring his Greek and Roman counterparts such as Dionysus and Bacchus. Interestingly, the Maya themselves may have considered this state of intoxication, or drunkenness, to be closer to the patron god Akan. There were even cases where priests and officials got high on other substances, from tobacco and morning glory seeds to mushrooms. In some cases, Akan was also depicted as a close friend of Kukoc, the Maya god of creative endeavors, also underscoring how the artistic style was seen as an extension of recreational activities. Number 11. Ekchua. Ekchua was a post-classic Mayan deity who was revered as the patron of both merchants and cacao. He was possibly also perceived as the protector of travelers among the Mayan gods, as can be discerned by the depiction of him with objects such as a backpack and spear. Taking the depictions, Ek Chua was usually shown as a deity that was streaked with black and white or was completely black. Her mouth was rimmed with a reddish-brown border, while her lower lip was large and droopy. In the Mayan culture, cacao was treated as currency. Thus, by extension, as a merchant god, he was seen as the patron of cocoa merchants and cocoa plantation owners. In that sense, many of these merchants even held festivals in honor of the merchant god, particularly during the harvest. Number 12. Kukulkan. Also known as the Feathered Serpent or Quetzalcoatl in Aztec mythology, Kukulkan's origins date back to the late pre-classic period as evidenced by a depiction of the serpent god found at the Olmec site of La Venta. The stela, which dates to sometime between 1200 and 400 BC, represents a snake that sticks its head out from behind a person. More elaborate depictions of the serpent version are found on the six-tiered Maya pyramid built in honor of the god, dating to around the 3rd century AD. Incredibly, given the diversity of cultures in Mesoamerica and the ever-evolving nature of myths and traditions, Kukulkan, as a central figure, was also portrayed in ways that went beyond the morphology of serpents. For example, there are some representations of Kukulkan, dating from around 700 to 900 AD. Some of them possibly even drew inspiration from human rulers who carved their legacy by influence and conquest. The question may be raised, why was the deity particularly associated with a serpent? Well, 
According to some scholars, the snake in its most basic form in Mesoamerican culture could have represented the earth and vegetation. Archaeologist Carl Taub hypothesized that the feathered serpent, by virtue of its evolved morphology, may have been associated with fertility and intricate political classes in the region. Number 13. Camazots While not exactly counted among the Mayan gods, Camazots was sometimes fused with divine entities. However, Camazots is the name attributed to humanoid bat-like creatures, or rather vampire-like entities, that are downright dangerous and vicious, so much so that one of them cuts off the head of a mortal hero, only to later play with his head in a gruesome ball game. Interestingly, in terms of conventional zoology, all three known species of vampire bats are actually native to the New World. So, it really comes as no surprise that it is Mayan mythology that brings up the legend of a mythical vampiric creature. But the fascinating part is that the Kamazots legend bears many similarities to the well-known vampire stories of later times. In that sense, some narratives describe Kamazots as a purely evil entity with the sole purpose of causing terror. Unsurprisingly, in some depictions, Kamazots was depicted holding a sacrificial knife in one hand and a human or victim's heart in the other. Number 1. Itzamna. This god was counted among one of the most popular Mayan deities in the pre-Columbian pantheon. He was designated as the king of heaven, night and day. In the mythic narrative, his dominance over these vast domains is powered by innate and even arcane knowledge, as opposed to supernatural strength and unquestioned kingship. To that end, he was often portrayed as a toothless old man with a gentle demeanor, a hooked nose, large eyes, and a cylindrical hat, alluding to his leadership qualities. In some cases, he is portrayed as the son of the powerful but capricious creator god Hunab Ku, who caused floods to wipe out the human race. Rather, Itzamna is portrayed as an antithesis to his father, as he helps the ancient Maya invent writing, sacred calendar systems, agriculture, science, and Mayan medicine. This suggests that, mythically, Itzamna also played his role in the creation of human beings. In short, he was perceived as a cultural hero who laid the foundation for a civilization that would later flourish. Itzamna is also identified as the husband of Ixchel, and together they were revered as the couple who gave birth to a whole generation of powerful gods. Interestingly, in terms of etymology, Itzamna means lizard or big fish in the Mayan language, with the prefix ITZ also alluding to divinity, prediction, and even witchcraft in other associated Mesoamerican languages. To that end, Itzamna is also called by other names, including Kukulkan, and being depicted as a feathered serpent or even as a hybrid creature with human and lizard features. Number 2. Ixchel Ixchel was an important female deity in the Maya pantheon. Often called the Rainbow Lady, the goddess is associated with the moon, weather, fertility, children, and health. In the mythical narrative, she was known for the dual aspect of herself. As goddess, she was represented as a young and beautiful seductress who advocated fertility, marriage, and love. In this aspect, she became associated with both lunar cycles and rabbits, and was often given epithets such as Ixik U, Moon Lady. Historically, the deity's eminence as one of the important goddesses can be discerned from the depictions of her in works of art and centers of worship. To that end, the Maya may have made a pilgrimage across the Caribbean in ceremonial canoes to one of their temples on the island of Cozumel, now the ruins of San Gervasio. She, on the other hand, was represented as a withered old woman who had the power to create and destroy the earth. Counted among the mighty gods of the Mayan pantheon, the goddess was also depicted with claws, fangs, and a red body adorned with symbols of death and skulls, and this incarnation was called Chak Chel, Red Rainbow. Number 3. Kinich Ahau Kinich Ahau was the name of the sun god of the Yucatecan Maya, that is, the Mayan people of Yucatan. Interestingly, in some cases, given her association with an element of the sky, the Mayan god is also considered to be an aspect of Itzamna, the aforementioned ruler of the heavens. In a mythical narrative, Ixchel, the goddess of the moon, impresses him by wearing a fine woven gown. 
and the two eventually become lovers, although their relationship later turns tumultuous. As for the representations, Kinich Ahau, in keeping with her royal status, was often depicted with a hooked nose, large square eyes, and even a beard. And like other comparable Maya deities, the great god was also represented in a dual way in some codices, as an old man with crooked teeth. Incredibly, he was also associated with the jaguar in Mayan culture, as the sun god was believed to transform into the feline predator at night. In addition, he was further revered as the patron god of the unit of day. Number 4. Chak Chak was the Mayan deity of rain, which made him a very important figure in the agricultural civilization of the Maya. In addition, he was also revered as the god of thunder and storms, with a particular motif based on a myth suggesting how he struck clouds with jade axes to cause rain. Such powerful actions nurtured the various crops, especially maize, which is often attributed as a gift from Chak to the Maya people after he discovered the plant inside a rock, and he furthered the natural cycle of life in terms of regeneration. Now, in terms of history, it should be noted that Chak probably played his symbolic role in the human sacrifices performed by the Mayan priests on top of the pyramid temples. To that end, some of the attendants holding the victims might even have dressed as Chak to represent the four cardinal directions. Regarding the myths of the Mayan culture, he is presented as the brother of the sun god, Kinich Ahau. And while these brothers were close, Chak fell in love with the beautiful wife of Kinich Ahau and consequently suffered the punishment for her immoral relationship. To that end, few Mayan legends tell how the rain is produced when Chak cries out for repentance, thus contradicting the axe effect in the clouds. Many Maya kings were revered as rainmakers, which underlines his strong relationship with Chak. Interestingly, despite being the gods of rain, Chak was believed to dwell not in the skies, but in the depths of caves and cenotes. Number 5. Yum Kimmel Things get a bit complicated when it comes to the mythical reach of the Mayan gods of death. The reason is that there are quite a few deities that were associated with the aspect of death. Yum Kimmel, also known as the fleshless god adopting the state of decomposition, was depicted with his skeletal mask, protruding belly, full of decaying matter, body adorned with bones, and no neck adorned with eyeless sockets. In some narratives, he rules over the nine subterranean worlds known as Mitnal. Within this hellish realm, Yum Kimmel takes sadistic pleasure in extinguishing the very essence of souls by torturing them with fire and water. Interestingly, his counterpart, or other aspect, Apuk, despite the deadly air of him, has some comedic or scatological elements, some involving flatulence and anus. Number 6. Yum Kaax Known as the Lord of the Forests, he was possibly among the youngest of the Maya gods and goddesses. The deity, as his name suggests, was probably revered as the guardian of the forest and protector of wildlife, both flora and fauna. Often depicted with an elaborate corn headdress and pots of corn cobs in hand, he was possibly worshipped by farmers and hunters alike. The above connection alludes to how the Mayan god was also revered as a deity of agriculture, so much so that many offered their first fruits to the deity of the forest. As for the latter, hunters had to offer special prayers and rituals asking for Yumkax's permission and guidance, especially when hunting deer. Number 7. Hunhunapu He was revered as a tragic figure in Mayan religion, which was more important culturally because of his two sons, the hero twins Hunapu and Ixbalank. In the most prominent tale, Hun Hunapu and his own brother were tricked by the Mayan death gods into a ball game only to be sacrificed later. His head was hung as a trophy on a gourd tree. However, the head of Hun Hunapu, which still had the divine sentience of it, spat at a passing young woman, thus impregnating her with her saliva. Later, she gave birth to the hero twins Hunapu and Ekspalanke, who avenged her father by defeating the gods of the underworld. Unfortunately, the twins were unable to resurrect his father after retrieving his head. Symbolically, however, the Maya believed that Hunhunapu was reborn as corn. Number 8. Huracan. Residing in the infinite sky, Huracan or Heart of Heaven, as one of the main Mayan gods, was believed to be the primordial force unleashed by the dual divinities. The creator gods needed this chaotic force to chisel the order of creation and its manifestation on the physical plane. 
In a nutshell, Hurricane was considered to be the antithetical being whose essence and behavior ironically lead to the survival of life. An example would belong to a mythical narrative that supposes how it was Hurricane who sent a great flood to end an entire generation of humans and invoke the earth for the renewal of life. Given his immense power and his chaotic origins, Hurricane was often associated with lightning, wind, and storms, with the former often perceived as a manifestation of both fire and fertility. Interestingly, in some tales, Hurricane is the one who opened the mountains with his lightning to reveal the hidden corn seed, which led to the agricultural prowess of the Mayan people. As for the representations, the Mayan god of the storm was represented with a branched nose and a leg that transformed into a snake at the end. Number 9. Ixtab Incredibly, the Dresden Codex contains a relatively graphic image of a dead or passed out woman with a rope around her neck dangling from the celestial sky band. And this mythical motif is often perceived as representing Ixtab, the Mayan goddess of suicide. However, on closer inspection of the Dresden Codex, the image of the hanged woman is depicted in the section dealing with eclipses, and as such, this particular depiction may have signified the occurrence of a lunar eclipse. As for another hypothesis, Ixtab could have been the female version of Atab, a minor Mayan god of the hunt associated with trapping or tricking. Consequently, the female counterpart of her was possibly regarded as the benevolent executioner, who was also associated with cheating. Number 10. Akan. Often associated with alcoholic beverages, Akan was considered one of the Mayan gods who delighted in boisterous celebrations and drinks. Unsurprisingly, he was the patron of the Balche, a Mesoamerican cocktail made from fermented honey and the bitter bark of the Blash tree. Essentially, Akan was possibly perceived as the divine partier, thus mirroring his Greek and Roman counterparts such as Dionysus and Bacchus. Interestingly, the Maya themselves may have considered this state of intoxication, or drunkenness, to be closer to the patron god Akan. There were even cases where priests and officials got high on other substances, from tobacco and morning glory seeds to mushrooms. In some cases, Akan was also depicted as a close friend of Kukoch, the Maya god of creative endeavors, also underscoring how the artistic style was seen as an extension of recreational activities. Number 11. Ekchua. Ekchua was a post-classic Mayan deity who was revered as the patron of both merchants and cacao. He was possibly also perceived as the protector of travelers among the Mayan gods, as can be discerned by the depiction of him with objects such as a backpack and spear. Taking the depictions, Ekchua was usually shown as a deity that was streaked with black and white or was completely black. Her mouth was rimmed with a reddish-brown border, while her lower lip was large and droopy. In the Mayan culture, cacao was treated as currency. Thus, by extension, as a merchant god, he was seen as the patron of cocoa merchants and cocoa plantation owners. In that sense, many of these merchants even held festivals in honor of the merchant god, particularly during the harvest. Number 12. Kukulkan. Also known as the Feathered Serpent or Quetzalcoatl in Aztec mythology, Kukulkan's origins date back to the late pre-classic period, as evidenced by a depiction of the serpent god found at the Olmec site of La Venta. The stela, which dates to sometime between 1200 and 400 BC, represents a snake that sticks its head out from behind a person. More elaborate depictions of the serpent version are found on the six-tiered Maya pyramid built in honor of the god, dating to around the 3rd century AD. Incredibly, given the diversity of cultures in Mesoamerica and the ever-evolving nature of myths and traditions, Kukulkan, as a central figure, was also portrayed in ways that went beyond the morphology of serpents. For example, there are some representations of Kukulkan, dating from around 700 to 900 AD. Some of them possibly even drew inspiration from human rulers who carved their legacy by influence and conquest. The question may be raised, why was the deity particularly associated with a serpent? Well, according to some scholars, the snake in its most basic form in Mesoamerican culture could have represented the earth and vegetation. Archaeologist Carl Taub hypothesized that the feathered serpent, by virtue of its evolved morphology, may have been associated with fertility and intricate political classes in the region. Number 13. Camazots. 
While not exactly counted among the Mayan gods, Kamazots was sometimes fused with divine entities. However, Kamazots is the name attributed to humanoid bat-like creatures, or rather vampire-like entities, that are downright dangerous and vicious, so much so that one of them cuts off the head of a mortal hero, only to later play with his head in a gruesome ball game. Interestingly, in terms of conventional zoology, all three known species of vampire bats are actually native to the New World. So, it really comes as no surprise that it is Mayan mythology that brings up the legend of a mythical vampiric creature. But the fascinating part is that the Kamazots legend bears many similarities to the well-known vampire stories of later times. In that sense, some narratives describe Kamazots as a purely evil entity with the sole purpose of causing terror. Unsurprisingly, in some depictions, Kamazots was depicted holding a sacrificial knife in one hand and a human or victim's heart in the other. One Freyr. Freyr of the Vanir tribe was a Norse god of peace and prosperity. Among other things, he was associated with masculine virility, the sun, and fair weather. Freyr, often depicted with a huge phallus, was worshipped throughout Scandinavia, particularly Sweden, where he was celebrated at weddings and harvest festivals. Along with his twin sister Freya, Freyr was among the foremost Vanir deities. A man of many magical possessions, Freyr commanded Skidbladnir, a ship forged in the furnaces of Svartalfheim by the dwarf craftsmen Broker and Sindri. Freyr was also accompanied by another of Broker and Sindri's creations, the mechanical Gullenbursty boar. The boar had a golden mane and bristles that glowed in the deepest gloom. Finally, Freyr wielded a sword that had the ability to fight on its own. The loss of this weapon would ultimately contribute to his demise during Ragnarok. Freyr ruled over Alfheimer, a kingdom of the Light Elves. Like Freyr, the Light Elves were known for their peace and goodness. 2. Loki the great trickster god of the Norse pantheon, Loki was a devious deity known for his many schemes and deceptions. A shapeshifter, Loki's transformations were as varied as the motives for his pranks, which included wealth, women, wisdom, or just pure pleasure. At various times he took the form of a salmon, a flea, a fly, and a mare. With Loki, appearances were never what they seemed. While his antics frequently got the gods into sticky situations, his tricks often rescued them from hard times as well. Where Thor, Freya, and even Odin strove to enforce a just order among the gods, Loki's erratic behavior called into question the very nature of his loyalties. Loki married the goddess Sigyn, about whom little is known except that by Loki he had a son named Nari, or Narfi. Loki also bred with his lover Angerboda, a Jotun, possibly a troll, who gave birth to three children, Hel, who ruled the eponymous underworld called Hel, Jormungandr, the Midgard sea serpent, and Thor's archenemy, and Fenrir, the huge wolf destined to kill Odin during Ragnarok. 3. Nerthus Worshipped in Scandinavia and the Germanic territories, Nerthus was a dark goddess associated with peace and prosperity. She was related to Njord, the Norse god of the sea, although whether they were consorts or separate incarnations of the same deity is unclear. Known as the bringer of peace, Nerthus was honored during a ritual wagon procession. During this ceremony, the goddess's priests would drive a chariot covered in her sacred cloth through Germanic villages, causing the inhabitants to lay down their weapons and embrace each other in celebration. While little is known about Nerthus outside of this ritual, she was thought to reside in her sacred grove on an as-yet unidentified island. 4. Thor A paragon of masculine strength and virility, the storm god Thor was the fiercest of the Norse deities. Among his many abilities, Thor commanded storms and rain and brought lightning and thunder. Due to his prodigious sexual drive and his ability to impregnate women, Thor was also associated with fertility. He wielded a warhammer called Mjolnir and was thought to have red hair and a red beard. Brave, powerful, and just, Thor fully embodied the hero archetype. Where Odin and Loki prowled and schemed, Thor faced his troubles with hammer in hand and violence in his heart. Whenever a fearsome beast or cunning Jotun threatened his peace, the gods usually called on Thor to intervene. 5. Heimdall Heimdall the Watcher was a Norse deity of the Aesir tribe. 
a god of keen eyesight and hearing who was ready to sound the Jallerhorn at the start of Ragnarok. From the little evidence that has survived, Heimdall appears to have been a protector of the deities and a guardian of the passages to and from the Nine Realms. Because of his supposed role of granting wisdom and social order, he was also considered the father and protector of human beings. He could see night as if it were day, and could spot a target from a hundred leagues away. Furthermore, it was said that his sense of hearing was so acute that he could hear the grass grow and the wool of the sheep sprout. 6. Baldur, Baldur of the Aesir tribe, was the most beautiful and beloved of all the gods in the Norse pantheon. Baldur radiated charm and was so physically beautiful that he gave off light. He was also described as the wisest of all the gods. As an arbiter of disputes, he settled disputes between gods and men. Baldur's death as a result of Loki's betrayal was one of the central stories in Norse mythology. Baldur's main attributes were his justice, beauty, and sympathy. He owned a large ship called the Hringhorni, meaning ship with a circle on its stern, which was said to be the largest ship ever built. After Baldur's death, the ship became a huge funeral pyre for his body. 7. Frigg As the wife of Odin, Frigg was the undisputed queen of the Norse gods. Frigg was often depicted sitting on a throne or in a commanding pose. Frigg lived in Fensalir, a watery realm that probably took the form of a swamp, marsh, or wetland. Frigg had power over many areas of life, and was associated with fertility, marriage and the home, love and sexuality, wisdom and prophecy. Frigg was a vulva, or practitioner of the magical art of Seder, and she sought to divine or alter the future through ritual. 8. Tyr The one-armed god of the Norse pantheon, Tyr was a member of the Aesir tribe who represented war and bloodshed. Somewhat paradoxically, he was also known as a bringer of justice and order. The most detailed description of the god was derived from the Gilfaginning, a book of the Prose Edda by the 13th century Icelandic scholar Snorri Sturluson. Tyre's most notable attribute was his missing right hand, or arm, usually depicted as being severed at the wrist or forearm. This missing limb had been eaten by Fenrir, the ravenous giant wolf sired by Loki and the Jotun Angerboda. 9. Njord. The Norse god of wind and waters, Njord was the patron of sailors and fishermen. He also brought wealth to the just and deserving. As patriarch of the Vanir deities, Njord led his tribe against the Aesir gods during the Aesir-Vanir War. If you are interested in knowing more about this war between the Norse gods, leave it to me in the comments below, and we may make a video in the future. He would later join the Aesir as part of a peace deal. Njord was a popular god among the Norse, and sailors in particular. Those who worshipped him did so in the hope of receiving the reward of the seas. In Norway, the center of Njord's cult, locals continued to offer prayers to him well into the 18th century. As befits his status as the god of the wind and the waters and master of the destinies of the fishermen, some scholars maintain that Njord lived on the sea, in a kingdom known as Noatun. 10. Idun the lovely and charming Idun was a Norse goddess of youth and fertility. Idun had the power to grant eternal youth and prevent old age. Her magical apples imparted the gift of youth to those who ate them. She played a key role in Norse myths, rejuvenating the gods by giving them magical apples that reversed the effects of aging. Whenever the Norse gods began to feel the effects of aging, they turned to her. She carried her apples in a box made of ash called an eski. Along with her fruit, this box served as one of her main symbols. 11. Freya One of the main deities of the Norse pantheon, the lovely and lovely Freya was a goddess of blessings, love, lust, and fertility. A member of the Vanir tribe of deities, Freya shared her people's penchant for the magical arts of divination. Freya was kinder and nicer than the other Norse deities. Where Thor achieved her goals through aggression, and Odin and Loki resorted to deceit, Freya achieved her ends with the softer persuasions of gifts, beauty, and sex. While Freya used to be selfless and helpful, she had a darker side. Like the male gods, Freya had a taste for blood and fought fiercely in battle. It was said that she claimed the lives of half the warriors killed in battle. Freya was recognized as the archetypal Volva, a practitioner of cider, whose art and ritual could see events before they happened. The Volva could then attempt to alter these events, leading enemies to their doom and sparing friends from impending disaster. 12. Odin 
As the total father and chief god of the diverse Norse pantheon, Odin figured prominently in all core mythological traditions, from the creation of the first humans and the aesir vanir war that united the gods into a single pantheon, to the Ragnarok prophecies that mark the end of time. Odin's main attributes were his wit, cunning, and wisdom. Having cultivated the magical arts of Seder, the set of rituals that allow foresight, Odin was able to see the future and commune with the spirits and the dead. He was also a shapeshifter who could take the form of snakes, eagles, and other powerful creatures. Additionally, Odin spoke in poetic verse and had the power to charm humans into committing acts out of character. Pick up that coffee. Throw it in your face. Odin was often depicted with a staff or spear, but otherwise wielded no specific weapons. On multiple occasions, he consulted with Mimir's severed and embalmed head, which revealed many secrets to him. Number 1. Olorun Olorun is the supreme god, the creator of the universe. He is the source of all life and destiny, but is a distant god who does not involve himself directly in human affairs. Olorun is a central deity in Yoruba cosmology, a religious and cultural tradition originating with the Yoruba people of West Africa, especially present in parts of Nigeria, Benin, and Togo. Olorun is the supreme being above all other deities or Orishas in the Yoruba tradition. While Orishas may be worshipped and propitiated directly by humans in various ceremonies and rituals, Oloran transcends these acts and is seen as the ultimate source of all energy and life. Although Oloran is the supreme deity, the Orishas act as intermediaries between humans and the spirit world. These spirits have specific functions and domains in the natural and spiritual world. However, they all derive their power and existence from Olorun. Number 2. Orunmila he is not just one deity among many, but the very guardian of the deepest mysteries, the whispering voice that knows every twist and turn of the labyrinth of destiny. With eyes that have seen the rising and setting of stars, Orunmila contemplates the web of life with a depth and clarity that defies comprehension. His vision penetrates the mists of tomorrow, deciding the path each soul must take. Bearer of the IFA divination system, Orunmila not only sees what is written in the stars, but has the ability to interpret, guide, and at times rewrite destinies. With his sacred tools and conch shells, he deciphers the enigmas of the universe, delivering his revelations to those who seek his wisdom. In the darkest moments, it is to Orunmila that mortals and spirits turn. For beyond his power and knowledge, he is the eternal compass that, with his light, guides lost souls to their true destiny. Number 3. Sango Within the impressive Yoruba pantheon, Sango bursts with force and fervor as the Orisha of lightning, thunder, and justice. With rumbling drums and the roar of storms, his presence is as powerful and overwhelming as the natural phenomena it represents. Sango symbolizes uncontainable power, passion, and authority. He is the righteous ruler who, with his double axe, punishes the wicked and rewards the righteous. Although he is feared for his wrath and his ability to unleash fire and destruction, he is also deeply respected for his unwavering sense of fairness and justice. Legends of Yoruba mythology tell that Sango was once a mortal king of the city of Oyo, known for his charisma, his skill in dance, and his control over fire and lightning. After his ascension to the spiritual realm, he became an Orisha, being eternally remembered for his prowess and fiery temperament. Some of the slaves brought to America were Yoruba, and as a result, brought the worship of Sango to the New World, which is why he is part of Voodoo. And since we are talking about Voodoo, I am thinking of releasing a video talking about Voodoo and its spirits, or Loa. Number 4. Ogun Ogun manifests as the Orisha of iron, war, technology, and manual labor. With the radiance of forged metal and the determination of the craftsman, his presence is as robust and essential as the tools he represents. Ogun is the patron of blacksmiths, farmers, hunters, and all those who work with tools and machines. His domain ranges from roads and frontiers to initiation and passage rituals, symbolizing the process of transformation and evolution. In Yoruba mythology, Ogun is known for his pioneering spirit, his ability to clear obstacles and create paths, both literally and metaphorically. Although he is known for his fierce temperament and warrior nature, he is also an innovator and protector, 
defending communities and facilitating technological and social progress. Number 5. Oshun. Oshun is one of the most revered deities in the Yoruba tradition and is known for his wisdom and his ability to grant wishes. She stands out as the Orisha linked to the river, water being her main element. She is the emblem of purity, fertility, love, and sensuality. Despite her divinity, Oshun possesses human traits that bring her closer to her devotees, vanity, jealousy, and rancor. There are countless legends that frame Oshun's transcendence in the Yoruba Cosmovision. She is often portrayed as a motherly, protective, and benevolent figure who watches over humanity. She is also known as the custodian of spiritual balance and is revered as the mother of sweetness and pleasure. One of the most emblematic stories about Oshun places her at the center of human creation. According to Yoruba mythology, Oloran, the supreme god, sent several Orishas to Earth to give it life and prosperity. Among these Orishas, Oshun stood out as the only female presence among 17 deities. While her male counterparts repeatedly failed in their mission, it was Oshun who, realizing her omission in the divine plan, decided to act. With the generosity and potency of her waters, Oshun brought life back to Earth, making the existence of mankind and other creatures possible. Number 6. Babalu-ai Babalu-ai occupies a special place as the Orisha of illnesses and, on the other hand, of healing. He is the guardian of ailments and afflictions, but also of remedies and cures, demonstrating the duality of his nature. Babalu-ai represents not only the physical pain and suffering that can affect the body, but also the resilience and recovery of the human spirit. It is a bridge between discomfort and restoration, between imbalance and the return to health. The stories and legends of Yoruba mythology describe Babalu Ai as a deity who can punish with illness when disrespected or taboos are broken, but who also has the compassion and knowledge to offer healing. His dominion extends over epidemics, plagues, and diseases, but also over herbs and rituals that alleviate those ills. Number seven. Oya. Oya rises with power and passion as the Orisha of winds, storms, and transformation. She is the protector of the mysteries of life and death, and her presence is as tempestuous as the wind that represents her. Oya symbolizes constant change, the ebb and flow of life, and the uncontainable power of nature. She is said to have the ability to bring winds of change, both literally and figuratively, carrying with her profound and often tumultuous transformations. Tales from Yoruba mythology describe Oya as a fierce warrior, with a temperament as unpredictable and powerful as a storm. However, she is not only destructive, she is also a figure of renewal and regeneration. After the storm comes the calm and the opportunity for a new beginning. Oya also has a deep connection to the realm of the dead, often being seen as the guardian of the cemeteries and a mediator between the world of the living and that of the ancestors. Number 8. Isu Esu is the Orisha of destiny, change, and communication between the divine and earthly realms. He acts as the messenger of the Orishas, transmitting offerings and communications between humans and the gods, but is also known for his mischievous nature and his ability to create confusion and conflict. Isu represents the unstable balance between good and evil, the duality of life, and the unpredictability of fate. He is often described as the guardian of crossroads, symbolizing the decisions we make and the directions we choose in life. Legends and tales from Yoruba mythology describe Esu as a cunning deity who enjoys playing tricks and testing humans. However, his antics are not simply for fun. They are often intended to teach lessons, reveal hidden truths or realign destiny. Despite his sometimes deceptive nature, Esu is central to Yoruba worship. He is offered before any other Orisha to ensure that messages and sacrifices reach their proper destination. He is the mediator and facilitator, the one who ensures that communication between the worlds keeps flowing. Number 9. Yamaya. Yamaya shines as the queen of the oceans, the mother of all waters and protector of the children of the earth. Her presence is as deep and all-encompassing as the ocean itself, and her love for her children is as immense as the waters she rules. Yamaya represents the essence of flowing life, motherhood, and fertility. She is the mother who cares and protects, and in whose lap all find solace and refuge. It is said that all rivers flow towards her, symbolizing her capacity to receive, nurture, and protect all. The stories and myths of Yoruba mythology portray Yamaya as the primordial mother from whom all forms of life originate. 
Although she is loving and compassionate, she can also be fierce when it comes to defending her children or punishing those who harm them. Number 10. Orisha Oko, in the Yoruba tradition, is the Orisha specifically in charge of agriculture, soil fertility, and the harvest. He is an essential deity for communities that depend on the land for their livelihood and well-being. Orisha Oko has a close bond with the earth and is revered primarily by farmers and those who seek to ensure a bountiful harvest. He blesses the soil, ensuring that it is fertile and conducive for planting. He is often associated with colors such as green, which represents vegetation and the fertility of the earth. Its symbols and sacred tools are often linked to agriculture. Its relationship with Olakun, the deity of the deep sea, can be seen in the context of the water cycle, essential for agriculture. Number 11. Olokun. Olokun is revered and respected as the Orisha of the ocean depths, the domain of the unknown and the hidden riches of the sea. His kingdom encompasses the mysterious and dark depths of the ocean, where the light of the sun does not reach, and unfathomable mysteries and secrets are attributed to him. Olokun symbolizes both the serenity and the ferocity of the ocean. He is the peace of the deep waters and also the powerful force behind the great waves and storms. He is an Orisha of wealth, abundance, and prosperity, for it is believed that the riches of the sea, such as fish and submerged treasures, are under his guardianship. Yoruba mythology is replete with tales that highlight the magnitude and power of Olakun. Although he reigns in the depths, his influence is felt on the surface and in the interplay between ocean and land. He is often described in a symbiotic relationship with Aganju, the Orisha of the earth and volcanoes. Together, these two Orishas represent the balance between the sea and the land, a dance between the known and the unknown. Number 12. Aganju. Aganju is revered as the Orisha of the earth, the vastness of the wilderness and in some contexts of volcanoes and mountains. He is a deity of great strength and power, associated with the creation and transformation of the terrestrial landscape. The figure of Aganju is crucial in the connection between heaven and earth. His dominion over the earth, deserts, and inhospitable places makes him a pillar in the survival and adaptability of humanity in the face of geographical adversity. Numerous myths surround Aganju, highlighting its ability to forge and transform the land. It is the sustenance of the dry land and a pillar in the formation of mountains and geographical features. Its influence is not only felt in the formation of the land, but also in the ability of people to overcome obstacles and adapt to new environments. Number 1. Ometeotl. In Aztec mythology, he was a binary god, responsible for the creation of the universe. The Aztecs believed that before Ometeotl created himself, the universe was unknowable, and for all intents and purposes, did not exist. Residing in the thirteenth and highest heaven, this god existed outside of human influence and rarely interacted with other deities. There has been a debate among scholars about the nature of Ometeotl. Some have argued that they represented a dual god, while others argued that this was a misinterpretation imposed on the Aztecs by historians who read a divine multiplicity, similar to the Holy Trinity, in the translated texts. Ometeotl was unique among the Aztec gods in that no temple was ever erected to them. After creating themselves and having children, their role in Aztec mythology was minimal. Although his sons were four of the most important gods in the entire Aztec pantheon, these gods operated independently of their father's influence. While the Aztecs believed that Ometeotl was immensely important due to his role as creator of the universe, the Aztecs also believed that he was beyond the reach of human influence. Consequently, they did not build temples or offer sacrifices to him. Ometeotl's first notable action in Aztec myth was to bear four children. Although the first three of his children were born complete, the last son of Ometeotl, Huitzilopochtli, was born without meat, only bones, and would remain in this state for 600 years. During this time, the other gods simply waited for Huitzilopochtli to complete himself. They could not create the world without it. Number 2. Huitzilopochtli the famous Aztec god of war, Huitzilopochtli was the patron god of the Mexica people and a key figure in the creation of Aztec cosmogony. He led the Aztec people to Tenochtitlan, a fact not easily forgotten. 
so much so that half of the city's Templo mayor was dedicated to him. Fallen warriors and women who died in childbirth were thought to become part of his retinue. After accompanying Huitzilopochtli for a period of four years, the fallen warriors would be reborn as hummingbirds. Befitting his status as a god of war, he was believed to be an immensely powerful warrior. He wielded a shield, war darts, and shiuquatl, a lightning-like fiery serpent, as a spear. Despite his amazing martial prowess, the Aztecs believed that Huitzilopochtli could be defeated. Legends held that the god of war would one day meet his mate, and that his fall would mark the end of the Aztec Empire. Huitzilopochtli played many roles within the Aztec pantheon and was revered as the chief god of war. Sacrifices were made to him after every victory and defeat, and the dawn of creation even stood still and awaited his arrival. Number 3. Xiutakutli Purifier of the earth and renewer of things, also associated with warriors and rulers. The word Ziwitl means year, time, and fire in Nahuatl which is why some sculptures in his honor have turquoise mosaics, the same that were buried during rituals. He is represented with reeds on his head as a headdress to put out the fire. His figure resembles that of a stooped old man carrying a huge brazier to symbolize his ancient origin and wisdom. Number 4. Siptotec was the Aztec god of agriculture, the seasons, goldsmiths, and disease. He was often depicted wearing a flayed skin suit, and the ceremonies associated with him emphasized his choice of attire. Such rituals usually culminate in a fresh skin suit made and worn by a statue of Zipe Totec, or one of his priests. Until recently, historians relied on post-conquest Spanish texts for information on the origins and cult of Zyptotec. However, in 2018, an excavation in Puebla, Mexico revealed a temple dedicated to the worship of him. The temple, which dates back to 1000 BCC and 1260 DC, belonged to the Andachiantahuacan people, who were later conquered and absorbed by the Aztec Empire. It is possible that the Aztecs already considered Zyptotec as one of their main gods before this conquest, since they shared a significant part of their pantheon with neighboring ethnic groups. According to Codex Ramirez, Zyptotec was born reddish all over. In most artistic representations, Zyptotec wore a flayed skin suit that was typically yellow or gold in color. His own exposed skin was often shown in red. While sacrificial stories were a common element in many religions, the Aztecs took this element a step further by engaging in a multitude of sacrificial rituals. Saipa Totec was just one of the gods that the Aztecs sought to appease through human sacrifice. Number 5. Quetzalcoatl Quetzalcoatl, the Aztec version of the feathered serpent deity, was the god of the wind, bearer of corn, and instrumental in the creation of the Aztec universe. Although he originated as a god of vegetation, Quetzalcoatl's role in Aztec myths expanded over time. When the Spanish arrived in the New World, Quetzalcoatl was considered the god of the wind, patron of priests, and inventor of calendars and books. He was also occasionally used as a symbol of death and resurrection. The feathered serpent deity common to much of Central America first appeared in images, statues, and carvings beginning in 100 BCE. Depictions of the feathered serpent generally took the form of a carved serpent head set on a wall, with further reliefs depicting feathers or birds. These carvings also included a conch, which was a symbol of the wind. Starting around 1200 AD, the way this god was represented began to change. From then on, he was often portrayed as a man wearing a conical hat, conch shell pectoral brooch, shell jewelry, and a red duck-billed face mask. Quetzalcoatl's role in Aztec cosmology was complex and multifaceted. While he was responsible for creating humanity and providing them with their staple crops, it was his brother Tezcatlipoca who ultimately ruled the modern era. Number 6. Tlaloc Tlaloc, the Aztec god of rain and one of the oldest Central American deities, was worshipped for more than 2,000 years, and his influence persisted long after the Spanish conquest. One of the oldest and most worshipped Mesoamerican gods was the Aztec god of rain and thunder. It was by his blessing that the seasonal rains arrived in time for the vital corn harvest. While rains from him often brought life to Mesoamerican societies, they could also take it away. If they came at the wrong time, or in the form of intense storms, the rains could ruin crops and cause droughts or floods. 
Tlaloc is one of several gods that the Mexica people refused to completely abandon after the introduction of Christianity, and in many ways, the veneration of him was never completely abandoned. These first images of Tlaloc were found on vases in Tlapacoya and showed his face next to lightning bolts. While we can't say for sure what Tlaloc's role was at this early stage or even what he was called, the imagery used to represent him remained remarkably consistent even over long periods of time. The Aztecs offered sacrifices to it to ensure that the seasonal rains arrived in time for a successful harvest. Before continuing Aztec mythology is very rich and wide, I have tried to bring the gods with more possible images to try to make the video enjoyable for you when you watch it. If this video reaches 1,000 comments, I will try to collect more Aztec gods and curious religions and their different gods, so take advantage to suggest future videos. Number 7. Mictlantecutli One of the oldest gods in the Aztec pantheon, Mictlantecutli was the Aztec god of death who ruled over Mictlan, the land of the dead. Like Hades, the Greek underworld, Mictlan was the place where most people spent the afterlife, regardless of their moral standing. This god was most commonly depicted as a skeletal figure, although reliefs depicting him as a skull with eyes have also been found. He was sometimes shown with his mouth open, ready to receive the stars that set and disappeared during the day. In the Aztec universe, each of the cardinal directions was associated with one of the divine realms. Instead of serving as a judge of the dead, Mictlantecutli simply tried to maintain order in his domain. This desire for order sometimes led Mictlantecutli to clash with other Aztec gods and his more creative desires. Number 8. Yacatecutli. In Mexica mythology, he is the god of commerce, patron of merchants and exchange, mainly in commercial trips. Travelers and merchants entrusted themselves to this figure. The rituals of sacrifice and offerings for this god were intended to keep the roads where travelers would travel clear and safe. Another ceremony that was used to honor him was the washing of the feet of the merchants when they arrived from their journeys, accompanied by offerings in the local temple. His name means the Lord of the Nose. He is represented as an old man with a stick formed by the union of sticks that guide the path of the walkers. His headdress is made of Quetzali feathers and gold earmuffs. His symbol is a bundle of rods traders carried an utl staff as they moved from village to village, selling their wares, and at night tied them together in a neat bundle, before dousing them with blood. It was believed that this ritual in honor of Yakatakutli would guarantee success in future business, not to mention protection against ferocious beasts and thieves on his travels. Number 9. Kotlikyu. She has been called mother of all the gods, and legend has it that she was the mother of Huitznahuac, gods of the southern stars, as well as the goddess Koyol Sauki and Huitzilopochtli, with whom she unexpectedly became pregnant. Kotlikyu is depicted as a woman with a skirt of writhing serpents and a necklace made of hearts, hands, and human skulls. Her feet and hands are adorned with claws, and her breasts are depicted hanging limp from pregnancy. Her face is formed by two facing snakes, after her head was cut off and her blood gushed from her neck in the form of two giant snakes, in reference to the myth that she was sacrificed during the beginning of the current creation. According to Aztec legend, Coatlicue was magically impregnated by a ball of feathers that fell on her while sweeping a temple and subsequently gave birth to the god Huitzilopochtli. Her daughter gathered the other 400 children of Kuatliku and incited them to attack and behead her mother. The instant she was killed, the god Huitzilopochtli suddenly emerged from her womb, fully grown and armed for the battle where he killed many of her brothers and sisters. Number 10. Metztli. Her name means the Black Moon. Lunar observation was of great importance to the Aztecs, since eclipses, comets, and other celestial phenomena could have catastrophic connotations. In addition, these observations allowed them to create a schedule to improve their harvests. She had the power to dominate the water through a snake that appears in different representations of her. She can also be seen wearing a skirt with embroidered crossbones, symbolizing the death that the inclement floods can cause. Number 11. Ixtlilton. Before seeing the last top, remember to subscribe and above all comment. This is the only way for YouTube to recommend the video to more people. Comment, even if it's to laugh at my pronunciation or the weather in your city. And now we can continue healer of diseases and caretaker of children's health.
He had the power to heal sick children, who went to the temple to ask for their healing through dances and pre-Hispanic concoctions. When the child got better, his parents offered a celebration at his house. His name means the one in black face, and depictions of him capture just that. In Aztec mythology, Ixtlilten was the Mexican god of medicine and healing, which is why he is often referred to as the brother of Macuiltzichitl, the god of well-being or good luck. He too was associated with dance, presumably because dance was a part of many medical cures. From the account of the general appearance of the temple, it would seem to have evolved from the tent or primitive lodge of the healers or shamans. One, Mazu. In Chinese mythology, Mazu is the goddess of the sea. Closely associated with the goddess of mercy, Guan Yin, Mazu is the patron goddess of sailors, fishermen, and travelers. She is especially popular in the coastal communities of southern China, in places like Fujian and Macau, and in overseas Chinese communities. It is not uncommon to see Mazu temples or shrines every few kilometers along Chinese coastal roads. 2. Nuwa. In Chinese mythology, Nuwa is considered the first being with the ability to procreate and is the creator of all humanity. Ancient Chinese society was fiercely matriarchal, so Nuwa, being the mother of all humans, was considered a very important deity. She is involved in various stories, but is most commonly associated with China's creation myth and for saving humanity by patching a hole in the sky after a great flood. Today, Nuwa remains a popular deity, and women who need divine help with marital matters or fertility problems usually pray to her. In art, she is usually depicted as a supernatural creature with a human face and a long, serpentine body, but sometimes she is also drawn simply as a woman dressed in traditional Chinese hanfu. 3. Fuxi In Chinese mythology, Fuxi is seen as humanity's first male ancestor, a culture hero, and one of the most benevolent gods of ancient China. Fuxi is credited with creating several innovations that benefited mankind, such as the invention of the writing system, fishing, and the domestication of animals. In art, Fuxi is often depicted with the head of a human and the body of a snake, like her sister Nuwa. Fuxi is considered to be one of the most beloved deities in Chinese mythology because he brought civilization and all its benefits to humanity. 4. Jade Emperor one of the most important and popular figures in Chinese mythology, the Jade Emperor, is the supreme ruler of heaven and the first emperor of China. He is also considered an especially important Taoist deity. With all of his specialized roles and social hierarchies, the Jade Emperor's court parallels the structure of ancient Chinese monarchies. The emperor's justice, benevolence, and mercy were traits that true Chinese emperors sought to emulate. Even today, the Jade Emperor plays an important role in Chinese life, especially around Chinese New Year. During the New Year, the Jade Emperor is said to judge each individual's character over the past year and punish or reward them accordingly, so that you understand me as if he were the Chinese Santa Claus. 5. Shi Wang Mu Shi Wang Mu, or Queen Mother of the West, is one of the oldest and most powerful goddesses in the Chinese pantheon. She has complete control over life, death, creation, and destruction. She is married to the Jade Emperor and attends the Peaches of Immortality in the gardens of her palace. It is believed that Shi Wang Mu was once a wild demon that lived in the mountains and caused catastrophic disasters. After repenting of her evil ways, she attained enlightenment and became a goddess. 6. Chang'e in Chinese mythology, Chang'e is best known for stealing an elixir of immortality from her husband, the legendary archer Hao Yi, and escaping from her to become the goddess of the moon. One of the most important and popular stories in the Chinese canon, the story of Chang plays a central role in the annual Mid-Autumn Festival. In some versions of the myth, she is doomed to repeatedly consume the herb for all eternity. 7. Hao Yi In Chinese mythology, Ho Yi is considered the greatest archer of all time. He is best known for marrying the moon goddess, Chang'e, and for shooting down nine of the ten sons. Once an immortal who lived in the palace of the Jade Emperor, Hu Yi made the decision to become a human in order to help humanity in times of need. 8. Guan Yin In Chinese mythology, Guan Yin is the goddess of mercy and is considered the physical embodiment of compassion. She is an all-seeing and all-hearing being 
to whom worshippers call in times of uncertainty, despair, and fear. Although she can take both male and female forms, in Chinese tradition she is most often depicted as a woman. 9. Sun Wukong In Chinese mythology, Sun Wukong, also known as the Monkey King, is a trickster god who plays a central role in Wu Chengen adventure novel Journey to the West. Wukong is blessed with unparalleled superhuman strength and the ability to transform into 72 different animals and objects. Each of his hair has transformative powers, and he can also magically manipulate wind, water, and fire. Characterized by his short temper, impatience, and proneness to anger, Sun Wukong is one of the most important and beloved literary figures in Chinese culture. 10. Neja in Chinese mythology, Neja is a precocious adolescent deity who serves as the patron saint of young adults. After gestating in her mother's womb for three years and six months, Neja was born with superhuman strength and the ability to speak. The Chinese myth of her is based on the Hindu god Nalakuvara. 11. Long Wang. In Chinese mythology, Long Wang rules the seas and is known as the Dragon King. He is a fearsome guardian deity who controls all dragons, sea creatures, oceans, and weather. Although he has a temper, Long Wang is seen as a symbol of good fortune and the mythological embodiment of the concept of Yang. He is the most popular among the Chinese coastal communities. 12. Zhong Kui, known as the Demon Hunter, is a Chinese deity and folk hero who fights ghosts. Frustrated by an unsightly appearance as a mortal, he committed suicide and was granted supernatural powers in the afterlife. Legend has it that Zhang Kui commands over 80,000 ghosts and demons himself. 13. Pangu In Chinese mythology, Pangu is a hairy, horned beast considered the first living thing in the universe. His story begins before the beginning of time and serves as an explanation for the creation of the universe. It is said that Pangu was born from an egg that contained the entire cosmos. When he finally broke free, he freed the universe and created the earth and the sky. As one of the oldest stories in Chinese mythology, the Pangu myth has countless variations. 14. Immortals The Ba Xian, also called the Eight Immortals, are a group of legendary heroes from ancient times who fight for justice and defeat evil, according to Chinese mythology. Popular during the Tang and Shang dynasties, the Eight Immortals are said to live on a group of five islands in the Bohai Sea. Although they have always been an important part of Chinese oral history, their stories were first recorded by the Ming Dynasty poet Wu Yuantai. This group is considered especially important figures in Taoism. Each of them has their own special item from which they draw their powers. Number 1. Ganesha. The image of Ganesha is one of the most distinctive in Hinduism. Elephant head and human body, often pink. The elephant's head symbolizes the acquisition of knowledge through listening and reflection. The two fangs, one whole and the other broken, reflect the existence of perfection and imperfection in the physical world. The belly reflects the ability to digest whatever experience life brings. It is also a sign of well-being and of your role as provider of earthly riches. Number 2. Shiva. Shiva is one of the three main forms of Brahman and represents the power of destruction. Shiva has more than 100 names, but since the old has to be destroyed to make way for the new, his followers also see him as the lord of creation. Perhaps the greatest of the Hindu deities, he is bestowed with a variety of titles including Mahadeva, great god, Mahayogi, great ascetic, and Nataraja, lord of the dance. Shiva is depicted with snakes around his neck or through his body. The snake alludes to the spiritual power that can be developed through yoga and also to the power of Shiva to deal with death. The rosaries show his mastery of the spiritual sciences. He is often depicted sitting on a tiger skin, a symbol of the cruel forces of nature, of which he is master. Number 3. Vishnu. Vishnu is the sustainer. He can be represented with two or four arms. Vishnu images combine compassion and strength. The four symbols most commonly associated with Vishnu are the conch that represents water and the first sound of creation, the lotus that symbolizes the development of the universe, the mace that is interpreted as the power of knowledge that conquers time, and finally the disc, which is associated with the conquest of evil and ignorance. Number 4. Brahma 
Brahma, the creator, sometimes with a beard. He has four heads and four arms, which respectively represent the four Vedas, ancient holy books, and the four cardinal directions. His vehicle is a swan or a goose. Since creation is the work of the mind and intellect, Lord Brahma symbolizes the universal mind. He is mainly worshipped by seekers of knowledge like students, teachers, scholars, and scientists. Number 5. Krishna Krishna, the attractor or lure of people and drainer of sins, is the eighth and most important avatar of Vishnu. He embodies joy, freedom, and love. Krishna is known as the commonly depicted blue-skinned god playing his flute with seductive powers. He is one of the best-known gods with a witty and playful character. A wonderful and mischievous boy becomes a young man loved by the gopis, the cowherd girls. His participation with the gopis in the love dance symbolizes a passionate union with God. As one of Vishnu's avatars, his role is to bring hope to the earth and free it from evil rulers. The Yanmashtami festival in August celebrates the birth of Krishna. During the two-day festival, Hindus pray, fast, sing, and perform reenactments of Krishna's life. If you are liking the video, give it a like, and remember to subscribe to support the channel even more. Number 6. Rama Rama, which means one who pervades and is present in everything and everyone, is the seventh avatar of Vishnu. The Ramayana, which is one of the most popular stories in the Hindu tradition, recounts the exploits of Rama. Rama is the model of reason, correct action, and commendable virtues. He is often depicted wearing a tall, conical cap that symbolizes his royal status. Rama represents the ideal man, as conceived by the Hindus. In the Ramayana story, Rama's personality depicts him as the perfect son, devoted brother, true husband, trusted friend, ideal king, and noble adversary. Diwali, or Festival of Lights, is a famous Indian festival celebrating Rama's triumph over a demon king named Ravana, after which Rama was able to return to his people after 14 years of exile. The celebration takes place over five days, and each day has its own meaning. During this holiday, lights are lit around their houses, symbolizing the victory of good over evil. Goddess Lakshmi is also commonly worshipped during this festival. Number 7. Hanuman Hanuman, whose image is in the form of a muscular monkey, is associated with the Ramayana, the story of Rama and Sita. Images of Hanuman often show him holding the mountain in his hand. A model for human devotion to God, he too is depicted with his paws folded in reverence. He represents strength and loyalty, and exemplifies the idea that animals are also part of creation. Hanuman is the son of the wind god, so he can fly and change shape at will. He is one of the few gods without a consort. Number 8. Durga Durga means the inaccessible one. Although loving and kind to those who worship her as Shiva's consort, she also symbolizes the violent and destructive qualities of the mother goddess, Shakti. These qualities are explained by a story from the Hindu tradition, according to which she was born fully developed from the flames that issued from the mouth of the Trimurti and other deities, who created it with the purpose of destroying the buffalo demon, symbol of death. Her vehicle is a lion or a tiger, which denotes her violent and aggressive qualities. Before the cosmic creation, Shiva invoked goddess Durga from her left half to be a part of his Shivlok. Durga is a female energy who defeated the demon Mahishasura, who was wreaking havoc on the earth. Goddess Durga is believed to be the same energy, lightning, that came out of Vishnu's mouth and merged with the lightning emitted by other gods. She is a pure form of energy and is also known as the Shakti of the impersonal absolute. Number 9. Laxmi. Laxmi is the goddess of fortune and wealth and the consort of Vishnu. She is usually called Shri. She is associated with the Diwali festival as a bringer of blessings for the new year. A four-armed goddess of good fortune, she holds lotus flowers and showers wealth in the form of gold coins. She is also the goddess of beauty, and as such she appears young and beautiful, adorned with jewels. She often sits on a lotus, which is a symbol of fertility and purity. Lakshmi's vehicle is a white owl. It is common for Indian homes to have the image of her in the home. Number 10. Sarasvati Saraswati is the consort of Brahma. She goddess of wisdom and music, and of the arts in general. She is usually depicted as fair-skinned, beautiful, elegant, and dressed in white garments. It is said that she created Sanskrit, the ancient sacred language of Hinduism. 
Her vehicle is usually a peacock, but she can also be seen with a swan or goose, the vehicle associated with Brahma. Saraswati is the goddess of learning, knowledge, and wisdom. Hindu students are encouraged to pray to her, especially before exams or other intellectual activities, as it is believed that she can impart wisdom. Number 11. Indra. Indra is the king of heaven and the leader of the devas. He is the god of rain. Iravat, an auspicious white elephant, is his vehicle or his vahan. His weapon, which represents both a diamond and lightning, is called a vajra. Indra is one of the most important deities, often shown as a cunning god, sending obstacles in the path of devotees, especially asuras, with the aim of ruining people's efforts to please the gods. Indra represents strength and courage. Number 12. Harihara. Harihara is the combined incarnation of two supreme Hindu deities. Hari represents Vishnu, and Hara represents Shiva. Due to this fusion, devotees of Vishnu and Shiva follow Harihara as the form of the supreme god. Harihara, therefore, shows the importance of all gods as the supreme power in the universe. Harihara's iconography is divided into two halves. One half depicts Shiva holding the trishul, a drum, and a deer. The other half that represents Vishnu has the conch and the chakra. Number 13. Kumar Kartikeya. Kumar is a Hindu warrior god. He is also known by the names of Kumar Kartikeya or Kartikeya. One of the main objectives of his birth was to kill the demon Tarkasur. Because of this, the Kirtikas raised him away from his parents to protect him from Tarkasur's attempts to kill him. After attaining the powers from him, Kumar was appointed commander-in-chief of the Devas in the battle against Tarkasur. Due to his courage and skill, Kumar was offered the position of King of Heaven, but he turned it down as he considered his role as commander-in-chief to be more important. Number 1. Svarog Svarog is the father god of Slavic mythology, like Zeus would be for the Greeks or Odin for the Norse. The occasional sound of hammers and splintering wood would have been the first sound of life you'd hear when approaching a Slavic village. This meant shelter, comfort, and most importantly, vitality for many travelers. Svarog, the god of fire and blacksmithing, was one of the most important Slavic gods. He was the Slavic version of the Greek god Hephaestus, and his name was directly related to fire and heat. For various Slavic tribes, he was credited with the title God of the Sun, as well as God of Fire. Equipped with a celestial hammer, he forged the sun, which helped create the world of the living. After this process was done, Svarog fell into a deep sleep. In this state of deep sleep, all his dreams directly characterized everything that happened in the world of the living. It is believed that if he awakens from his dream, the world of men would immediately collapse and he would experience an impending apocalypse. However, Svarog's importance as a god of creation is symbolized as a blacksmith. He is directly linked to vitality due to the importance of fire and the sun. The symbol of him stands as one of the most important and sacred in Slavic culture. Armed with a red-hot hammer and a fiery beard sprouting from his chin, Svarog's fierce impact on Slavic creation myth cannot be overstated. Number 2. Svarozic Svarozic is the undisputed leader of the Bogovi, the god who manages their rogue divinities and holds the pantheon together under his leadership. A brave and tireless warrior, Svarozic drives the chariot of the sun through the world each day keeping it alight and protecting it against the depredations of the forces of chaos and destruction. He is also the god of the earth, letting the chariot rest overnight to oversee the flames of the earth when they keep humanity warm overnight. Although Svarozic is stern and the absolute laws of him, he in truth is no less vibrant than the rest of his pantheon. The occasional moments of pity from him and even his mistakes are proof enough of that. Svarojic was the first god created by Svarog at the beginning of the world, and it was he who was left with the task of shaping it and putting it in order when his old father went back to sleep. She first carefully placed Svarog to rest inside the shining egg of the sun, which she kept on her chariot for transport across the sky for safekeeping. And then she set about taming the magnificent, golden-maned celestial horse, grazing peacefully in the heavens, and do not allow any living thing to come near it, except a watchful rooster that alerted you to danger. 
Using his many eyes to always observe all sides of the creatures, he crept up to them, always staying on the side where the eyes of the rooster and the horse were closed until he was close enough to catch and tame the horse. Now able to travel the new world and see all its corners, he found it to be in disorder and chaos, and to help provide order, he created the four points of the compass to divide the lands and the progression of time to keep the past and the present apart. Everything else in the world he created from the fiery dung of the heavenly horse. And lastly, he created the rest of the Bogovi to help him and his brother Dajbog in the administration of the world. Number 3. Dazbog. When faced with the god of dawn, beauty, and youth, it's hard to do anything but love Dajbog, who along with Svarajic was one of the first gods created to warm the world and make it habitable. When he is not riding his splendid diamond chariot through the skies, Dajbog provides the much-needed warmth of dawn to keep Svarojic moving on his journeys and rules the morning quarter as one of the four divine kings, Lord of the East. Each day he slowly ages from when he is a youth at dawn until he dies at dusk as an old man, but he is reborn each morning, a symbol of youth's eternal renewal, ready to rise again and carry on. On one of his many journeys across the morning sky, Dajbog chanced upon the goddess of Spring Lada, a stunningly beautiful maiden bathing and playing in the ocean. In love, he descended from heaven on a ray of sunshine and called upon the king of the sea, Tsar Mora, to come and grant him the hand of his daughter in marriage. However, Lada was the Tsar's favorite daughter, and he was so enraged by Dajbog's attempt to steal her from him that he ordered the great seahorses to trample the sun god unconscious. Dajbog's screams reached the ears of Svarog, who withdrew the sun's rays to allow his child to escape. But Dajbog was still obsessed with Lada and could not rest without her love. Realizing that he could not win her alone, he went to her brother Svarojic for help. Svarojic advised her to display a tempting assortment of jewelry and dresses along the seashore. When Lada went ashore to try them on, Svarojic grabbed her and fled from her in her own chariot to deliver her to Dajbog. Tsar Mora was enraged at the loss of his daughter, but she immediately married Dajbog and remained with the other Slavic gods, far beyond her reach. Because he flew over the world every day, Dajbog saw humanity living in damp and uncomfortable conditions, suffering the vagaries of the weather, or taking refuge in cold, stony caves. Seized with the desire to help them, and thus encourage them to worship him, Dajbog descended to Earth and taught them how to create homes and build houses, giving them the first foundations of civilization. Number 4. Perun Perhaps the most beloved by mankind of his pantheon, Perun is the god of ill-tempered storms, the keeper of rain and the devastating arrows of lightning, and the leader of the war that once led the Slavs to victory against his enemies. While he is not particularly bright and is prone to breaking the rules when it suits him, Perun is a staunch fighter and brave in battle, always ready to rally the troops and inspire loyalty. As the bringer of rain and herald of spring, he is also a figure revered for his gifts of fertility and prosperity throughout the year. One of the four divine kings who rule with the authority of Svarojic, Perun oversees the dark side of the world and the dark reaches of the north. Although the gods were forbidden to interact with humanity, Perun enjoyed his attention and sought to become the most beloved of all the Slavic gods. He saw that mortals were cold and suffered in the dark of night, so he decided to give them the gift of fire, using his lightning to strike trees and set their tops on fire. At first the mortals were terrified and thought that Perun was punishing them for ignoring him, but after his voice whispered from the flames that they should come closer and warm, they discovered that fire was a wondrous gift. Stribog, the god of the winds, was given the task by Svarojic to put out any fire on earth so that humanity would not discover his secret. But Perun took him aside and convinced him that allowing only one would be harmless. Perun claimed that there were holes in his quiver and that some of his lightning bolts had accidentally fallen and started the fires. However, the gods would not hear of it. And due to Perun's actions, they declared that all direct interaction with humanity was now forbidden. Number 5. Veles. The king of the underworld is a lordly figure and highly respected among the Bogovi, who know that without him there would surely be chaos among the dead. As sovereign of the deceased, he has exclusive sovereignty over the vast fields of the underworld. And the living believed that he not only received them upon death, but also preserved them in life 
helping the most important grains and fruits of the earth grow to feed them. He also especially likes cattle, which is his sacred animal and which he protects from harm. Velez is also an accomplished shapeshifter and illusionist, able to fool even the most perceptive gods and take on a wide range of forms as various creatures, monsters, or men. This, along with his mastery over the arcane powers of fate, makes him one of the most powerful Slavic gods. Veles tended the lush, damp fields of the underworld for many years, cultivating the incomparably delicious food of the dead and guarding its borders against any invaders, while humanity starved in its caves and had to survive on only what meat it could catch. One day, a young human decided to leave for the land of Velus, of which he had heard many stories, in order to bring food for his people. Seeing that the boy intended to steal, Velus complained to Svarojic, who ordered the young man to be punished for his arrogance. The gods made him age a year each day, becoming gaunt and withered. But still he continued, determined to find Velus's bounty. Seeing that he was determined to help his people, one of the gods took pity on him, and secretly helped him overcome the obstacles, avoiding dangers and regaining his youth throughout the search for him, until he finally reached the border of the country of Velus and beheld a magnificent golden plant. The boy stole several sheaves of the plant and traveled home with his people to share it. Velus was furious at this challenge, but since Svarojic had decreed that the gods could not directly interact with humanity, he was forced to simply move the wondrous plant within the confines of the realm of death and place a three-headed wolf to protect it, that no mortal could touch it again. The people who had received the golden grain from Veles planted, cooked, and learned to love it, and his gratitude for his gift of wheat eventually soothed his irritation. Number 6. Chernobog Often described as the Black God, Chernobog is one of the most popular Slavic gods in the world. Due to his terrifying on-screen characterization of him in the 1940 Disney film Fantasia, he became widely known and recognized in pop culture. Myths and common sense suggest that the dark can never be your friend. Well, they may be right. As a herald of death, it was associated with famines and cannibalism. He was considered a personification of pure evil. The existence of Belobog and Chernobog is attributed to the symbolism of peace and chaos, evil and good, day and night, and light and darkness. Number 7. Belobog Belobog, the Slavic god of light, also known as the White God, although there are no historical records, the duality in Slavic mythology reaffirms its foothold within it. One can easily imagine that Slavic groups connected Belobog with healing and discovery due to his luminous nature. Number 8. Strybog. Without the wind, no ship would have marched forward. The wind is a vital driving force due to its constant and rhythmic existence. It stood as a symbolic embodiment of freedom and tranquility. Strybog, the god of the winds, was associated with the sea and travel. All winds, regardless of size, were considered to be his children. It can also be imagined that the voyages considered generous were blessed by Strybog, so that the ships could proceed without obstruction. He is depicted as an old man with a white beard, who carries a horn to signal the onset of the incoming winds. Strybog has a counterpart in Hindu mythology, namely Vayu, who is the lord of winds and a breath deity. Number 9. Lada. Love makes the world go round. Without love, there can be no progress among human beings. B-E-A-Utiful. According to some scholars, Lada was highly revered in Baltic mythology. Although there is no definitive proof, Lada stands as an important deity in Slavic folklore. Along with her twin brother on her side, she blessed the marriage and was a major promoter of love and beauty among her believers. Lada also has counterparts to her within other pantheons, such as Hera in Greek mythology and Freya in Norse mythology. If you are interested in knowing more about Greek and Nordic creatures, I recommend that you take a look at these two videos Number 10. Mokosh. Mokosh is the great goddess of the earth, guardian of the harvest and sustainer of all living things that depend on her. A temperamental and easily offended creature, she is equally likely to shower people generously with it or curse them with crop failure if they anger her. 
Her worshippers are very careful to avoid anything that might offend her and to observe the solemn festivals and sacrifices that ensure her continued goodwill. Despite her ability to ruin the livelihood of an entire community without batting an eyelid, Mokosh has a softer side. She is also a goddess of mothers and children, recognized as the patroness of weaving and spinning, and she is known to safeguard the herds and homes of those who show due respect. She reverently known as the Moist Earth Mother in ancient times. After Svarojic finished creating the world, Mokosh discovered that there was an uncomfortable burning sensation inside her that gave her no peace, day or night. She went to her father Rods for help, and he explained that he had swallowed a tiny spark of the divine fire of creation, and it had taken root within her. With her help, she endured the great pain of forcing the new creation out of her, giving birth to a race of giants in a cataclysmic eruption from the earth. Each successive generation of giants grew smaller and weaker, until finally they became the ancestors of humanity, and the giants disappeared altogether. Forever, humanity buried its dead in the ground to return their bodies to the great mother who gave birth to them. Number 11. Radagast the Night Lord is a dour and withdrawn figure, going about his business with a resolute determination and devotion to duty that is expected of a god with common sense and sober thinking. He has no time for frivolity or distractions, and he expects the same of everyone around him. Guardian of the wide stars, Radagast is also the god of twilight and flame, the fires that burn to keep humanity and its twins warm far up in the night sky. However, despite his imposing demeanor, Radagast is not without a certain magnetism. He is also the god of hospitality and partying, and he is known to visit the world more often than most as an anonymous reveler, making sure even unexpected guests are given a proper welcome. Although the moon goddess Chores had fallen in love with him, Radagast had no time for romance and ignored his advances to concentrate on his work. However, one night, when he arose to make his rounds in the evening sky, he discovered that his star-sprinkled cloak had been stolen, and he was nowhere to be found. Although he beat his servant for losing it, he was unable to locate it and was forced to personally guide the stars one by one that night, without the constellation patterns on the cloak to show them where to go. When he returned at the end of the night, the stars whispered that they had seen Strebog steal the cloak and use it to seduce chores. Furious at the theft and misuse of his property, Radagast demanded that Svarojic punish the wind god despite the return of the cloak. Number 12. Morana. The grim and deadly goddess of winter and the grave, Morana is a terrifying being, as imposing and terrifying as her fellow goddesses are beautiful. Tasked with ensuring that humans' lifespans end at exactly the right time, Morana spends half the year in the gloom of the underworld and the other half on the world, covering the silent and icy mantle of winter, leaving misery behind and misfortune in his wake. Despite her close association with the end of life, Marana also helped start it. She was also worshipped as a fertility goddess who prepares the soil for growing food, tending it through the cold of winter so that it will be fruitful when she finally leaves in the spring. Marana oversaw the oil lamps that burned for the life of every mortal, stored in eternal rows in her cave, beneath the perfect handprints of every living thing on the walls. Although she was diligent in preventing them from being tampered with or changed in any way, she got distracted at a crucial moment, and the goddess Pizamar managed to sneak past her to add oil to one of the lamps, increasing the life of a mortal. Marana was horrified and asked Svarojic to give her insurance that this would not happen again. In response, she made him a monstrous and frightening bat with 777 eyes and gave it to him as a companion and guardian to prevent further unauthorized visitors. Number 1. Pachamama Pachamama, revered by the Incas, is a deity intimately linked to agriculture and the essence of Mother Earth. Her importance lies in her role as protector of fertility and crops. The essence of this belief lies in the conviction that human beings must coexist in harmony with nature without abusing its resources. If this is not done, the Pachamama manifests her power, causing earthquakes. To gain the favor of Pachamama, Andean inhabitants used to perform and still perform ceremonies known as Payment to the Earth, in which they offer traditional products such as corn beer and cacao leaves. 
Shrines dedicated to her, made from logs and stones, can be found in different regions. Pachamama is generally represented as a serene and majestic woman, carrying in her hands the abundance of the earth, such as potatoes and cacao leaves. In territories spanning Peru, Bolivia, Chile, Colombia, and Ecuador, Pachamama is revered as the progenitor of Inti, the sun god, although some legends maintain that Inti was her consort. Number 2. Viracocha Viracocha was not simply one god among many for the Incas. He was the Alpha and the Omega, the primordial architect of the universe. Not only did he forge the cosmos, but he is also credited with having taught mankind, imparting wisdom as he journeyed across the earth. Long before the Incas emerged as a dominant civilization, Viracocha was already an object of veneration, and his legacy was perpetuated by Manco Capac, the first Inca monarch, who honored him with a ceremonial headdress and battle axe. More than a mere observer, Viracocha was intimately involved in the destiny of humanity. The myth narrates that at the dawn of time, during an era submerged in shadows, Viracocha shaped colossal stone beings. However, when they deviated from their purpose, the god decided to punish them with a flood of catastrophic proportions. Those who faced his wrath returned to their stone primordial form, reminding us of the omnipotence and justice of the creator god. Number 3. Inti Inti, the sun god, is more than just a mythical figure for the Inca Empire. He is the pulse, the heat, and the light that defines their world. Inti is the sun, Viracocha's brilliant gift to the world. Inti is a god so valuable and essential that he is represented in the most coveted metal, gold. This is how the Incas saw Inti, whether as a glittering sun disk or a golden mask. To them, gold was not simply valuable. It was a manifestation of the sun god. And in the heart of Cusco, there was his most precious representation, a statue in his honor. Inti, in his splendor, not only provides light, he governs the destiny of the crops. And if the day is ever suddenly darkened during an eclipse, it is a sign that something has disturbed the sun god. While he is usually generous and kind, he also has a side that the Incas would rather not provoke. To keep the god happy, they performed rituals and sometimes sacrifices, showing their deep respect and reverential fear for him. If this video reaches 500 comments, I will try to bring a part two of the Inca world, be it gods, heroes, or stories. So if you are interested in the topic, comment and reply comments to reach this goal. Number four, Amaru. Amaru, a fascinating figure of Inca mythology, is a two-headed serpent or dragon. This being shrouded in mystery had the ability to transit between the underworld and the spirit world, making him essential to the Inca world. Amaru is a hybrid entity. Although it has similarities with a dragon, its appearance combines features of several creatures. In Tiwanaku, Bolivia, a notorious representation shows him emerging from the Pyramid of the Sun Gate. This chimerical serpent radiates power and mysticism. Amaru is not simply a beast of legend. It was believed to have a direct influence on the world, emerging to announce rains, revolutions, or atmospheric changes. Despite its sometimes fearsome nature, the Amaru symbolizes the deep connection between humanity, the earth, and natural forces. It shows the unexpected and violent changes in nature, as well as the capacity for balance and renewal. It is the bridge between heaven and earth, manifesting itself in phenomena such as lightning. Number five, Ilapa. Ilapa, the god of thunder, had command over remarkable weather phenomena such as lightning, thunder, and hail. Ilapa was believed to have the ability to animate nature simply by touching the ground, causing trees and rocks to come to life. His love for creatures was said to be immense. During droughts, people would offer tribute to him to appease his anger and ask for rain. He was a fervent defender of justice, punishing with lightning those who committed injustices and rewarding those who showed kindness to others. Often depicted as an imposing warrior, Ilapa wore resplendent clothing and carried a sling. It is said that his imposing figure was adorned with a club, a sling, and multiple jewels. The sound of thunder originated from the movement of his sling, and the gleam of lightning belonged to his attire. Number 6. Apu in the spiritual traditions of Bolivia, Ecuador, and Peru, the term Apu refers to the guardian spirits of mountains and certain prominent rocks. These spirits, often visualized with human characteristics, play a protective role for the communities living in the foothills of the mountains. 
This belief has its roots in the Inca Empire, where the deeply spiritual Incas saw life and energy in various natural elements. For them, an Apu was a powerful mountain spirit, omnipresent in peaks and caves, protecting the people. The mountains were seen by the Incas as imposing lords who cared for the land and its inhabitants. Each sector of the Andean regions venerates its Apu, its sacred mountain, taking care of it and respecting it. In general, they are attributed a masculine nature, and the highest mountains were perceived as Apus of greater power. The mountains in their lofty majesty were bridges between the earthly world and the upper world, connecting people with powerful divinities. Number 7. Mamaquila. Mamaquila translates from Quechua as Mother Moon. In the Inca pantheon, she was a primordial divine figure, the moon goddess, sister and wife of Inti, the sun god. In addition to governing the menstrual cycle and marriage, Mamaquila had an essential function in the Inca calendar. Together with Pachamama and Mamacocha, she formed a trinity that symbolized different phases of the lunar cycle. Mamaquila was worshipped for her splendor and the goodness she provided to the earth. Bernabe Cobo, a 16th century chronicler, highlighted her cult due to her unequaled beauty and her crucial role in measuring time, as rituals were synchronized with the lunar calendar. In addition to her relationship with the calendar, she oversaw marriage and menstrual cycles, positioning herself as a vital protector of women. The main temple dedicated to Mama Killa was in Cusco, with priestesses serving and worshipping her. One curious myth related that the dark spots on the moon arose when a fox, captivated by its beauty, ascended into the sky and was crushed by Mama Killa, leaving those spots. Another account suggests that these shadows originated due to the ashes thrown by a jealous sun, since originally, the moon shone more brightly than he did. Lunar eclipses aroused fear among the Incas, believing that the moon could be pulled down from the sky, causing the end of humanity. Myths relate that during an eclipse, the moon could be sick, asleep, or under attack. Faced with this, people would try to scare off attackers by making noise or throwing objects at them. It was believed that it was the work of Pachamama to restore vitality to the moon. Number 8. Mama Kocha. In ancient Andean beliefs, Mama Kocha, or Mother of Water, was a powerful divinity linked to the vast world of waters. This goddess symbolized not only the immense sea but also the rivers, lakes, and springs that nourish the land. She was considered to have a special bond with Viracocha, the creator, being one of his wives and being the mother of the luminous deities Inti and Mama Kila. She was visualized as a young woman with a serene countenance. It is said that she descended from the firmament along with her brother to impart wisdom to humans, teaching them to live together in harmony and love. Under her tutelage and that of the Inca, the people built dwellings, paths, temples, and fortifications. Under her guidance, they cultivated the land, which in return offered them its blessings. Mama Kocha resided in the Hanan Pacha, or Upper World. Within the trichotic structure of the Inca universe, there was the Uku Pacha, Lower World, the K Pacha, Present or Earthly World, and the Hanan Pacha. In this celestial dimension, he shared space with virtuous beings and other prominent gods such as Viracocha, Inti, Mamakila y Pachamama. Tengrism is an ancient religion that is basically about respecting and connecting with nature and the sky. It is as if the universe has its own energy system and mystical beings. Imagine that, instead of just believing in one main god, you also recognize other spirits and forces of nature, all working together in a great balance. It's kind of like a deeper connection to the world around you. Number 1. Tengri Tengri is a primordial deity who represents the sky and is central to understanding the spiritual beliefs and worldview of the ancient Turkic and Mongolian peoples. Tengri is known as the god of the infinite and all-encompassing sky and is seen as an all-pervading force that is incomprehensible to the human mind. Tengri is omnipresent and omnipotent, but he is also distant. The veneration of Tengri goes back to ancient times. The nomadic cultures of the Central Asian steppes, including the Turkic and Mongolian peoples, worshipped him as the chief divinity in their respective pantheons. The observance of Tengrism declined with the spread of Islam, Buddhism, and other religions among these peoples. 
but Tengri and his teachings can still be found in many of their modern cultural and spiritual practices. Tengri is generally not depicted in a human or anthropomorphic form. Instead, he is associated with the vast sky and often with the eagle, an animal that is considered sacred in many Turkic and Mongolian cultures because of its ability to fly close to the sky. Worship of Tengri usually involved sacrifices and offerings, often carried out in high places where the worshippers were believed to be closest to the sky. Shamans, known as Tengrians, often played a central role in these rituals, acting as intermediaries between humans and Tengri. Number 2. Ume Ume is known primarily as the goddess of fertility and the protector of children and women, especially during childbirth. She is also seen as the goddess of nature and the earth. Her connection to the protection of children means that she is often regarded as a benevolent and loving deity. The veneration of Ume is ancient and dates back to early Turkic times in Central Asia. She is often associated with birds, especially the stork, which is seen as a symbol of motherhood. It is not generally given a definite human form, but when it is depicted, it is usually as a maternal figure or as a creature related to her attributes. Shamans, or spiritual intermediaries, used to invoke Umay to protect newborns, ensure fertility, and protect mothers. Rituals and offerings were often performed to ensure her blessing and protection. Like the ritual I'm going to have to perform for you to like this video, I don't ask you for blessings, better subscribe. I don't ask for protections either, I'd rather read you below in the comments. And what is my humble offering for this ritual? Continue to bring out these stories and mythologies that you like so much. Number 3. Erlik. Erlik is the lord of the underworld and is seen as a dark counterpart in Tengrist cosmology. He is the antithesis of Tengri, the sky god. Evil characteristics are attributed to him and he is considered the first shaman to fall from grace. According to some mythical versions, Erlik was the first being created by Tengri. But due to his disobedience or rivalry with Tengri, he was banished to the underworld. In some accounts, Erlik collaborates with Tengri in the creation of the world and humanity. But his contributions often have negative consequences, such as introducing death or disease into the world. Erlik rules the underworld, a place where the souls of the dead reside. Although his realm is associated with death and darkness, it is not necessarily hell in the sense of a place of eternal punishment. Rather, it is a place where souls wait and prepare for reincarnation or to follow their spiritual path. Erlik is often depicted as a dark figure, sometimes with demonic features. However, his specific image may vary depending on regional traditions and interpretations. Shamans, as intermediaries between the physical and spiritual worlds, often interact with Erlik in their spiritual journeys, especially when performing rituals to communicate with the dead or to guide souls to the underworld. Number 4. Koyash Koyash, in the mythology and religion of Turkic and Mongolian peoples, is the sun god in Tengrism. Although not as central as Tengri, the god of the sky, or Erlik, the god of the underworld, Koyash still occupies a significant place in Tengrist cosmology. Koyash is revered as the embodiment of the sun and is the personification of its power and light. He is often considered a symbol of life, energy, and renewal. In Tengrism, the cosmos is often visualized as a system in which heaven, earth, and the underworld interact in balance. Koyash, being the sun god, plays an essential role in this structure, providing light and warmth to the earth and serving as a counterpoint to the darkness of Erlik's underworld. In some Turkic and Mongolian traditions, specific festivals and rituals are held to honor Koyash, especially during the equinoxes or solstices, when the power of the sun is especially prominent. For the nomadic cultures of the steppes, the sun was crucial to daily life. Not only did it provide the light and warmth necessary for survival, but it also guided people's movements and activities. As a result, Koyash became a god of great practical as well as spiritual importance. Number 5. Ayata Ayata is considered the incarnation of the moon. He is revered as the god who controls and personifies the phases of the moon, its cycles and its effects on the earth. While the sun symbolizes light, energy and power, the moon in contrast symbolizes tranquility, renewal and cyclical change. Ayata plays a role in the balance between light and dark, day and night. 
As with Koyash, specific festivals and rituals are held to honor Ayata. The phases of the moon, especially the new moon and full moon, are times of ritual significance in some traditions. The moon, like the sun, was essential to nomadic cultures. Ayata, therefore, had practical importance. The moon helped to mark time, provided light during the night, and influenced certain activities and rituals. Number six, your sub. Your earth, and sub, water, are two deities working in symbiosis. The earth needs water to be fertile and sustain life, while water in many contexts needs the earth to contain and shape it. In some mythical accounts, it is said that after Tengri created the sky, Yersub emerged as the next primordial deities, giving rise to the creation of the tangible world. Together, they formed the seas, rivers, mountains, and valleys. For nomadic cultures, the relationship with land and water is fundamental. Rivers and lakes are vital for the supply of water for livestock and people. In addition, land in the form of grasslands is essential for feeding livestock. Honoring your sub is a way of recognizing and respecting the interdependence of these essential elements. Your sub can also be seen as a symbol of yin and yang, representing duality and harmony in nature. Earth is stable, constant and solid, while water is fluid, changing and adaptive. Number 7. Nature Spirits in Tengrism, as in many other indigenous religions and worldviews, nature spirits occupy a fundamental place. These spirits are considered living entities that inhabit and protect different aspects of the natural world, from mountains and rivers to trees and animals. Mountain Spirits, Taiga. They were believed to inhabit specific mountains and offer protection or challenges to those who enter their domain. Water Spirits, Suezi. These spirits inhabit rivers, lakes, and streams, Respect should be shown to them, especially when drinking water or fishing. Forest Spirits Trees and forests were believed to be inhabited by spirits that could offer protection or punish those who damaged their territory. Animal Spirits Animals, especially those that were vital to the subsistence of nomadic cultures, such as horses, had associated guardian spirits. The shaman, or calm in some Tengrista traditions, played a crucial role as mediator between humans and nature spirits. Through rituals, songs, and dances, the shaman could communicate with these spirits and request their guidance or intervention. Specific rituals were performed to appease, invoke, or thank these nature spirits. Offerings, which could include food, milk, or objects, were regularly offered to secure their favor and protection. The presence of nature spirits fostered a deep respect for the environment. It was not simply a matter of religious reverence, but also a pragmatic practice, Maintaining a harmonious relationship with nature ensured the survival and well-being of the community. Stories about these nature spirits were passed down from generation to generation. These stories served as moral lessons, warnings, or simply as entertainment, but always reinforced the sacred connection between the people and the land. Number 8. Ancestors Ancestral spirits, Essage. Ancestors are not seen simply as figures from the past, they are alive in the spiritual sense. It is believed that they can influence people's daily lives, offering protection, guidance, and blessings. Specific rituals exist to honor and communicate with ancestors. The anniversary dates of an ancestor's death are especially important and are observed with respect and ritual. Shamans act as intermediaries between the world of the living and that of the spirits, including the ancestors. Through rituals, trances, and songs, they can communicate directly with the spirit world and request help or guidance from the ancestors. These stone mounds or piles called obu act as altars or shrines to ancestral spirits in some Tengrista cultures. They are often found at sacred sites, such as crossroads, mountaintops, or springs. Some Tengrist traditions believe in reincarnation, where the spirits of ancestors can return to the world of the living in new forms. In this context, the birth of a child may be seen as the return of a deceased ancestor. Ancestor veneration in Tengrism is not simply a matter of tradition or respect. It is an integral part of how the world is viewed and interacted with. Ancestors act as a bridge between the past, present, and future, connecting people to their heritage and offering guidance and protection in daily life. Number 1. Ranginui and Papatuanuku In Maori cosmogony is the story of the love and separation of Ranginui and Papatuanuku, the Sky Father and the Earth Mother. 
This story not only tells of the creation of the world according to Maori tradition, but also shows the intimate relationship Maori have with nature and their environment. Ranginui or Rangi, he represents the vast sky. He is the heavenly father, the sky god who covers and protects the earth. Papatuanuku or Papa, she is the mother earth, the deity who gives life and nurtures all that exists upon her. She is solid, fertile, and eternal. In the beginning, Rangi and Papa were in an eternal embrace, completely united, with their children trapped in darkness between them. This darkness and confinement began to frustrate the sons, who longed for light and room to move. The bravest son, Tane Mahuta, god of forests and light, decided to separate his parents in order to free his siblings and bring light into the world. With a titanic effort, Tani pushed Rangi up and lifted Papa down, thus creating the world as we know it. Though separated, the love between Rangi and Papa never waned. It is said that the rain falling from the sky are Rangi's tears, crying for his beloved Papa, while the tremors and earthquakes are Papa's responses, feeling the same longing. Number 2. Taini Mahuta Taini is one of the most prominent and revered figures in Maori mythology. He is the god of forests, wildlife, and more broadly, creation. As you unravel his story, he reveals himself not only as a divine creator, but also as a representation of the cycle of life and the connection between all living things. Tain is one of the children of Rangi, the father sky, and Papa, the mother earth. He was born in the period when the two were intertwined in an eternal embrace. As we saw earlier, it was Tane who, seeking light and space, took on the arduous task of separating his parents. Using his shoulders and back, he pushed Rangi up and left Papa down, creating the space between heaven and earth and allowing light to flood the world. In his role as creator, he is also responsible for the formation of the first human being. He took clay from the earth and formed the figure of a woman, whom he named Hineahuan. By giving her life with a divine breath through her nostrils, humanity was created. He ascended to the heavens to bring the three kete, or baskets of knowledge, to the world, which also makes him the god of knowledge and the arts. Number 3. Tangaroa in the Maori pantheon, the vast and mysterious realm of the ocean is ruled by Tangaroa, the god of the sea. His domain encompasses not only the ocean depths, but also the beings that inhabit it and the forces that move it. By immersing oneself in the history and influence of Tangaroa, one can appreciate the deep relationship the Maori have with the sea. He is one of the principal sons of Rangi and Papa. In some versions of Maori mythology, after Tane separated his parents, Tangaroa became one of Tane's main antagonists due to competition for supremacy between the forest and the sea. As the god of the sea, Tangaroa rules over the waters and all that lives in them. Fish and other sea creatures are considered his children. Maori often invoke Tangaroa before setting out on sea voyages or while fishing, seeking his protection and blessing. Number 4. Tahiramatea, often known simply as Tahiri, is an imposing figure in Maori mythology, personifying the strength and power of the atmospheric elements. As the god of winds, storms, and other weather phenomena, his influence is felt in the fury of a storm or the gentle caress of a breeze. He is another of Rangi and Papa's sons. When his brothers conspired to separate their parents and bring light into the world, Tauhiri was the only one who opposed. He was deeply distressed by the idea of separating his parents and for this reason became antagonistic to several of his siblings after the separation. He vowed that he would make his anger felt through violent winds and storms. After the separation, he ascended to heaven to live with his father, and from there he controls the various winds, from those that caress gently to those that devastate with force. He had several clashes with his siblings due to his disagreement with the separation of his parents. He fought against Tan, the god of the forest, felling trees and raising the landscape. He also challenged Tangaroa, the god of the sea, churning the waters with storms. However, his most notable conflict was with Tumatawenga, the god of war and humanity, who resisted and defied the storms. Number 5. Tumatawenga Tumatawenga, often abbreviated simply as Tu, is a predominant figure in Maori cosmogony, representing war, human conflict, and indomitable courage. His presence in mythology reflects the combative and resilient aspect of the human spirit. 
As one of the primordial gods, he witnessed the period when his parents were bound together so closely that their embrace imprisoned the children in the darkness between them. During the time when the children of Rangi and Papa were arguing about how to separate their parents and bring light into the world, Tumatawenga proposed that they should kill their parents. However, it was Tana who suggested pushing them away, raising the sky and leaving the earth below. Although it was Tane's idea that was carried out, Tu's combative and decisive nature was manifested in his more radical proposal. After the separation of his parents, while other siblings found peaceful ways to occupy themselves, Tumatawenga, angered by his brother's resistance to his original plan, decided to make them pay. He learned the art of war and subjugated his siblings, turning them into sustenance and tools for humans. For example, he taught the humans to fish, thus subjugating Tangaroa, the god of the sea, and to hunt, thus dominating Tana, god of the forests. Number 6. Haumia Tikitaik Unlike his brothers, who represent elements such as the wind, the sea, or the forest, Haumia symbolizes the nutrition that comes directly from the ground. He is the god who rules over the plants that people harvest without sowing, representing the natural and spontaneous provision of Papa. He is the patron of wild plants and crops, especially tree fern, an iconic New Zealand plant, and kumara, a type of potato. Like his siblings, Haumia Tikitaik faced the wrath of Tawiri Matia, the god of weather, after the separation of his parents. To protect herself from Tawhiri Matea's raging winds and storms, Haumia hid in Papa's body, symbolizing the intimate connection between vegetables and the earth. Number 7. Ruamoko Ruamoko is one of the most distinctive figures in the Maori pantheon. He represents the subterranean forces and convulsions of the earth, being the personification of earthquakes, volcanic activity, and geothermal forces. He is the youngest son of Rangi and Papa. His birth and existence have a peculiarity. He never emerged from Papa's womb, and therefore remains inside her, which explains his influence on internal earth forces. The seismic and volcanic activity of New Zealand, known for its location on the Pacific Ring of Fire, is attributed to Romoko. According to tradition, the Earth's movements are caused by him tumbling around inside Papa's womb. New Zealand's geographic location, with its constant geothermal and tectonic activity, makes this a particularly relevant deity. Number 8. Wiro. Wiro holds an important place in the Maori pantheon, but not for being a benevolent or protective entity, but quite the opposite. He is the personifier of darkness, death, deceit, and all things malevolent, being an antagonistic figure in Maori cosmogony. Wiro is one of the sons of Rangi and Papa. Although he is the brother of other more benign divinities, his nature is notably different, leading him to be the main adversary of Tane, the god of forests and light. Wiro and Tane were in constant conflict, representing the eternal struggle between light and dark, good and evil. While Tani sought to uplift humanity and bring knowledge and light to the world, Wiro sought to counter these efforts and drag humanity into darkness and deception. After being defeated by Tane in a series of mythical battles, Wiro descended into the underworld, carrying lost souls with him and causing disease and misfortune in the world of the living. According to some tribes, when people die, their bodies descend to the underworld where they are devoured by Wiro. Each time Wiro eats a body, he becomes stronger. This process will eventually make him powerful enough to break free from the underworld, at which point he will surface and devour everything and everyone. Number 9. Hinehuoni. Hinehuoni, whose name is often translated as Earth Woman or Woman Formed from Earth, has a significant role in Maori mythology representing the creation of the first woman and thus the beginning of humanity. The story of Hinea Huone begins with Tani Mahuta. Although Tane had helped separate her parents to create the world, she felt a deep emptiness at not having offspring or companionship with whom to share her existence. With this desire in his heart, Tane fashioned Hinea Huone using the red mud from the ground, infusing her with vital essence and bringing her to life with a kiss. In this way, Hinea Huone became the first woman, from the union between Tain and Hinehuoni, a daughter named Haini Titima was born. In time, Haini Titima would play a central role in other Maori legends, later becoming Hina Nuitapo, the goddess of the underworld. If you have come this far, and you liked the video, is a good time for you to leave your like, share it with someone who might be interested, and leave your comment. This is a great way to support me so that YouTube, that god of internet mythology, recommend me to more people.
Number 10. Hinanuitepo. Hinanuitepo, whose name can be translated as the Great Lady of the Night, is a central figure in Maori mythology, personifying death and the underworld. Her role in Maori cosmogony is essential to understanding the cycle of life, death, and rebirth in Maori tradition. As we saw earlier, she was originally born as Hain Titama, the daughter of Tane. However, discovering that her husband Tane was also her father, overwhelmed by shame and grief, she fled to the underworld. There, she transformed herself into Hin Nui Tepo and assumed her role as guardian of the dead. In her subway realm, she receives the souls of the deceased and oversees their transition into the afterlife. She is charged with ensuring that the spirits of the dead do not return to the world of the living and disturb the natural balance. One of her most famous stories is her encounter with the demigod hero Maui. Maui, known for his mischief and desire for immortality for mankind, attempted to enter the body of the goddess while she slept, believing that by doing so he would defeat death. However, he was betrayed by a bird that laughed at his audacity and awakened Hain Nui Te po. She, realizing Maui's intention, killed him, confirming the inevitability of death for all human beings. Number 1. Pele Pele is, without a doubt, one of the most iconic and revered deities in Hawaiian mythology. Known as the Goddess of Fire, she is credited with creating the Hawaiian Islands through the eruptions of volcanoes and is often said to reside in the Kilauea Volcano, one of the most active volcanoes in the world. Pele is known for her passionate and sometimes volatile nature. Stories describe her as having a strong temper that can easily become inflamed, but also a great capacity for love and compassion. According to legends, the Hawaiian Islands were created by Pele's eruptions. She traveled from Tahiti, fleeing from her sister, the sea goddess Namakaokahai, and found refuge in Hawaii, forming the islands in the process. Pele is said to have moved from island to island, creating and destroying land with her volcanic power, before finally settling in the crater of the Kilauea volcano on Hawaii's Big Island. Number 2. Hiaka Hiaka is a significant figure in Hawaiian mythology, particularly in stories related to the volcano goddess Pele. One of her most famous stories centers on her journey to bring Lohiau, Pele's lover, from the island of Kauai to Pele's abode. During this journey, he faces numerous challenges, battles monsters and moo, supernatural beings in the form of lizards, thus demonstrating his power and skill. Although he eventually succeeds in his mission, his return is complicated by the fact that Pele, impatient and jealous, destroys the forest and his little sister's beloved human. In response, Hiyaka defies her sister by dancing a powerful and provocative hula and kissing Lohiao in front of Pele. This leads to conflict between the two sisters, although they eventually reconcile. Hiyaka is revered as the goddess of hula dancing and singing. Her story has been told and performed through hula for generations. She is also known for her healing abilities and is invoked in rituals and prayers related to health and wellness. Number 3. Namakaukahai also called Namaka, she is one of the oldest Hawaiian deities, belonging to a family of gods and goddesses who rule the natural forces of the Hawaiian archipelago. She is the daughter of Haumea, an important figure in Hawaiian mythology associated with fertility and birth. Although the depiction of Namaka can vary, she is often visualized as a powerful and majestic woman, representing the vastness and power of the ocean. Her imagery is often associated with water, waves, and the sea. As the goddess of the sea, Namaka is intrinsically related to the oceans surrounding the Hawaiian Islands. She has the power to control the tides, sea storms, and is the protector of ocean creatures. She is a powerful and sometimes fearsome force. Namaka is probably best known for her relationship with her sister Pele, the goddess of fire and volcanoes. As we saw earlier, according to legend, the two sisters had a violent conflict, which led to the creation of the Hawaiian Islands through volcanic eruptions and interactions with the sea. The conflict between the two represents the eternal struggle between fire and water, and it is a mythical explanation for the eruptions of the islands. Number 4. Ku in Hawaiian mythology, Ku is one of the four main deities, along with Kanaloa, Lono, and Kane. He is known primarily as the god of war, but also represents fishing, agriculture, canoeing, and rain. As the god of war, Ku is invoked to ensure victory in battle, 
During times of war, temples, or heiau, were built in his honor to ask for his protection and guidance. Ku is known to have various manifestations or forms. One of its most revered manifestations is Kuka Ilimoku, the land plucker, or land conqueror, which symbolizes the expansion and growth of the kingdom. During certain rituals or before wars, human sacrifices were performed at Ku's temples to gain his favor. These sacrifices were a significant and powerful part of the ancient Hawaiian religion and showed devotion and respect for Ku. Number 5. Lono Lono is one of the four main gods of Hawaiian mythology. He is revered as the god of peace, fertility, agriculture, and rainfall. He is responsible for providing Hawaii with abundant rainfall and ensuring a fruitful harvest. As such, he was a crucial deity in a culture that relied heavily on agriculture. Lono is central to the Makahiki Festival, which celebrates the rainy season and the harvest. This festival lasted several months, beginning in approximately November and ending in February. During this time, wars were suspended and the focus was on games, sports, dances, and offerings to Lono. Symbols traditionally associated with Lono include sacred staffs, fishing nets, and rain sticks, reflecting his dominion over agriculture and water. With its gentle nature and important role in agriculture and rainfall, it represents sustainable living and harmony with the land. Number 6. Cain Cain is revered as the god of the sun, light, and life. He is also considered the creator of man and the father of all living things in Hawaii. He is credited with creating the heavens and the earth. In some myths, he is mentioned as the creator of the first human beings, forming them from red clay. Representing light, Cain is a symbol of life and growth. As the sun god, his presence is essential to the existence and survival of all forms of life on the islands. He is also associated with fresh water. The springs and streams in Hawaii are considered the physical manifestations of Cain. Number 7. Kanaloa Kanaloa is widely recognized as the presiding deity over the oceans and deep waters. He is often invoked by fishermen and sailors to ensure safe voyages and an abundant catch. Kanaloa is often associated with Cain, the god of the sun and life. Together, they represent complementary forces in nature. In some stories, Kanaloa is described as the ruler of the realm of the dead or the underworld, which connects him to the concepts of death and regeneration. The octopus is a symbol associated with Kanaloa, representing the vast and mysterious depths of the ocean. In one story, Kanaloa and Cain travel the world together. Cain creates freshwater springs by striking the earth with a magic staff, while Kanaloa, attempting to imitate Cain, only creates salty springs, reinforcing his connection to the sea. In another story, Kanaloa is portrayed as defiant of the gods, eventually being banished to the underworld for his actions. Number 8. Hina Hina is widely recognized as the deity representing the moon in Hawaii. In some traditions, she is described as the mother who gives birth each night to the moon and places it in the sky. She is considered the patron saint of workers, especially those who work with tree bark and make tapa, a traditional weaving made from bark. In some versions of mythology, Hina is the mother of Maui, the Polynesian demigod famous for his heroic deeds. In one particular story, Hina is chased by a monstrous being and Maui kills it, transforming its body into the first coconut tree. There are tales that tell how Hina, tired of her earthly troubles, decided to visit the underworld. Her journey is full of challenges and adventures that lead her to interact with other gods and mystical creatures. Number 9. Poliahu Poliahu is the main Hawaiian goddess associated with snow, ice, and cold. Her home is said to be Mauna Kea, the highest peak in the Hawaiian Islands, which is often covered with snow in winter. She is described as a goddess of breathtaking beauty, with cold, pale skin that reflects her wintry nature. The most famous story involving Poliahu relates to her feud with Pele, the goddess of fire and volcanoes. The two divinities competed in a game of hula, but when Pele realized she was losing, she unleashed her volcanic fury. However, Poliahu proved to be just as powerful, covering Pele's fire with snow and ice. Despite her cold nature, Poliahu has numerous romantic stories and legends. One of the most popular tales tells of a mortal who falls in love with her without realizing her divine identity. Number 10. Kamapua. Kamapua'a has the power of transformation. Although he is most famous for his pigman form, he can also assume the shape of a fish, 
a fern, or even as rain. It is said that he was born as a mortal and suffered the ostracization of his family because of his pig-like appearance. However, despite this difficult beginning, he rose to become a powerful warrior and demigod. Kamapua'a and Pele have a complicated relationship filled with passion and conflict. In one of the best-known stories, after a fierce battle with Pele, Kamapua'a manages to appease his fury and the two become lovers. However, their relationship is short-lived and fraught with conflict. Despite the hardships he faced in his youth, Kamapua'a eventually becomes a defender of his people, fighting against those who threaten Hawaii and its inhabitants. Number 11. Kapo. Within Hawaiian mythology, Kapo is known as much for her ability for healing and fertility as for her connection to the dark arts. She is a multifaceted goddess who reflects the duality inherent in many deities of ancient cultures. She is especially known for her role in fertility and procreation. Ancient Hawaiians used to invoke her name and blessings in rituals related to fertility and conception. In addition to its role in fertility, it is also known for its ability in magic. She is said to be skilled in the use of spells and incantations and can employ magic for both good and evil. She has the ability to shapeshift, and in some accounts, she is described as transforming into a bird. Being sister to Pele, the goddess of fire and volcanoes, Kapo shares a deep bond with the forces of nature. Although their domains are different, both goddesses are powerful, respected, and feared in Hawaiian mythology. Number 12. Milu. Milu is a dark figure, being the ruler of the realm of the dead, a place similar to the concept of the underworld in other cultures. He presides over the realm where the souls of the dead are taken after death, a place of darkness and despair. Those who were not received by their ancestors after death, or who had broken kapas, taboos, were sent to his realm. This underworld is often described as an unpleasant region, in contrast to the upper realms inhabited by benevolent gods and spirits. Heroes and mythical figures occasionally travel to Milu's realm in search of loved ones or to perform heroic deeds. These journeys are often fraught with challenges and dangers. Number 13. Haumea. Haumea is considered an ancient figure in Hawaiian cosmogony. Her presence is vital, as she is associated with birth and creation. She is often depicted as the deity who gives life and sustains fertility, not only for humans but for the earth itself. While specific representations of Haumea may vary, she is often associated with elements of nature that represent fertility and rebirth. She might be visualized surrounded by vibrant plants and flowers, symbolizing her connection to flora and the earth, plays a central role as a giver of life, facilitating birth and renewal. It has the amazing ability to rejuvenate itself, to continue its cycle of giving birth. This represents an eternal cycle of creation and recreation, a continuous flow of birth, death, and rebirth. Her relationship to other deities highlights her central role in the Hawaiian pantheon, being the mother of many important gods. Number 14. Papahanaumoku and Wakea Despite being very distant and with an ocean in between, these gods are very similar Rangi and Papa of Maori mythology. Papahanamoku, also known as Papa, is the mother goddess who represents the earth. She is conceived as the creator and mother of all that inhabits the Hawaiian islands, including humans, flora, and fauna. In mythical narratives, she is the personification of the earth and is associated with fertility, nurture, and birth. Papa is a revered figure, symbolizing the deep and direct connection between the earth and living things. Wakea is the father god and is associated with the sky. He is said to be the progenitor and father of the main Hawaiian islands and, in some accounts, is also credited with creating the heavens and the earth. Wakea is a celestial god, representing the sky, daylight, and space, occupying the cosmos. The union of Papa and Wakea symbolizes the sacred connection between heaven and earth. Through their relationship, they gave birth to the first ancestors of the Hawaiian people, thus marking the beginning of Hawaiian genealogy.